Now I think I'm ready. Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good, good. Uh, I was having a little trouble getting this thing going for some reason. I'm not sure why. Did everybody else have, uh, uh, anyone have a difficulty getting through on the link? I guess not, huh? <clears throat> Okay, just bear with me here, folks. I'm a little uh, little rusty here after a couple of weeks of being out. Um, okay, uh, this is obviously an elective opportunity this afternoon. Um, anybody who is here will get uh, a little extra credit on their attendance grade. Hopefully that helps out. Some of you I think are struggling in that area perhaps. Um, I just wanted to go through basically the um, uh, the course in general, and um, let me ask you specifically here: Does anybody have any particular areas uh, that they are here to go over, um, or can I just go kind of chronologically through the modules at this point? Oops, getting quite a few uh, folks popping in here late. Okay, good. All right, then I'm gonna go through um, in order uh, from week one uh, and, I'll, and I will share my desktop, I think, and go over the modules with you guys. <clears throat> Let me get set up here. Okay. Alrighty. And I want to share my screen. Oops. Didn't it? Thank you. There it is. There we go. Okay. Okay, can you guys see my modules? Uh, okay. We can see it. Okay, good. All righty. So uh, I can skip, I think, this initial getting started menu here. Um, remember, just in case, um, it's worth mentioning that all of the reading materials are on your bookshelf. Uh, in terms of your textbooks that uh, I had reading assignments from throughout the course of the semester. So if you haven't accessed them here, uh, remember that they do exist on the bookshelf page in the modules section. Um, I've also given you guys, and I don't know how many of you have looked at this, um, but I've given you a glossary of film and lighting terms. This was created by uh, the same author who has uh, given us the uh, camera assistance handbook, which is also on your bookshelf. So this is another volume by this author. Um, and you can use that if you ever get stuck on a word that you see in the reading, or if you're looking over some material studying for your, uh, your final quiz, you may find uh, appropriate definitions or useful terms and definitions here. Okay, um, I did put the decks uh, that I lectured from uh, on this page called All Decks in Your Startup Menu. They are in PDF form. And I'll just warn you that for some reason, when I transfer my keynotes, which have a um, gray background into PDF form, uh, they come out with a white background <laughs> for some reason. Um, and sometimes uh, it makes it a little difficult to read the cells, but they all, but they are all there uh, for each of the lectures that I gave um, this semester. Uh, if you prefer not to plow through those and try to distinguish uh, uh, the PDFs, you can go to the YouTube page. And I'm sure you're all aware of those because each of these um, recorded lectures will direct you to my YouTube page and you can find the actual uh, recorded lecture there by section number 
uh, under film 2461C, okay? So in the first section, uh, we talked about um, cinematography in the broadest sense. Um, I talked to you a little bit about the types of tools I like to use like Cooked Optics TV. Um, a number of videos in the uh, semester were referenced uh, through this website. Uh, Cook Optics has uh, graciously uh, approved of my use of their instructional videos in my tutorials. And so you can go directly to their web page if you like. It's Cook Optics TV. Um, they're also on YouTube. Um, or you can see uh, in any one of my uh, sections uh, any of the selected videos that I deemed appropriate for this course. Uh, we looked at um, the video being a cinematographer. We looked at some uh, definitions from working cinematographers in the industry. Um, and we discussed what the role of the cinematographer is. So the importance of this particular uh, section would simply be um, to open up the conversation for the course of the semester about the roles, the duties of, um, and the concerns of the cinematographer in the context of motion picture and television production. Okay, so I've spoken over the course of the semester about the um, the difference, I think, between cinematography and what I would consider, consider conventional uh, videography or um, simply uh, video content production. And I differentiate that in terms of the use of um, camera movement and uh, interpretive dramatic lighting specifically. Uh, in the creation of images for motion picture and television. Um, you might expand those definitions if you are, uh, if your career goals uh, are not inclusive of feature and television production, but I tend to think of uh, cinematography in terms of that footprint. In other words, camera operation through uh, the efforts of a team uh, of camera assistants, operators, uh, the director of photography, the digital imaging technician, uh, and so forth. Um, it's a very deliberate process. And I think over the course of the semester, hopefully I demonstrated to you that it is uh, more than simply um, uh, a solo endeavor. Um, the cinematic acquisition of images, I think involves a number of collaborative relationships uh, not only uh, with the camera team, but also with lighting uh, crews and a number of other individuals on, on a given working set, all contributing uh, to the overarching uh, objective of those meaningful narrative images. So the introduction uh, is basically uh, in the spirit of those conversations. Um, I don't think there's anything I can add to that specifically um, I would uh, refer you to the specific lecture uh, that's pre-recorded if you want to get any of the specifics of that conversation. I don't think we should linger on it here. I'd rather jump into uh, some of the more specifics. So section one was simply a broad discussion about the role of the cinematographer. In section 1.2, uh, I gave you some very specific uh, individuals to have a look at. So I gave you reels uh, or websites by uh, Roger Deakins, Emmanuel Lebetsky, Christopher Doyle, and Seamus McGarvey. Now these are just four individuals um, who uh, in this case all happen to be um, uh, American Society of Cinematographers members, if I'm not mistaken, including Chris Doyle. Um, and each of these are notable in their own right, but they are not by any means uh, the only examples of exemplary cinematography uh, being crafted uh, in the contemporary film world. Uh, some of you may have your own uh, personal favorites. I just use these folks um, because they are notable. They do have fairly high profile work that can be seen in a variety of uh, venues online. Um, and I, I do believe that their work is uh, rather exemplary. Um, I had you guys do some reports uh, in section 1.2 uh, where I had you do a little bit of um, research on um, 
maybe your favorite TV show or your favorite feature film um, and reference that cinematographer in a, in a short paper. Hopefully this activity uh, created some awareness for any of you that haven't thought about the role of a cinematographer prior to this class. Um, I think that a lot of times um, what we do is sort of default our, our, um, our awareness of a particular contemporary work um, by means of its director. Um, and I think that um, there are a number of individuals that are responsible and, and collaborate in the process to uh, produce the contemporary works that we all subscribe to. And so the cinematographer being just one of those individuals um, that rarely um, gets discussed openly in broad conversation. Usually there's a default to the director or to the actors concerned with a specific work. And so this assignment was really designed to create awareness for just the number of individuals that are working, not, not so much silently in the background, but certainly don't get the, the, um, the spotlight um, <laughs> as I've as I have nicknamed the assignment, they, they don't seem to enjoy the same sort of spotlight or the same um, notoriety and conversation. So hopefully this assignment um, gave you a sense of who's out there and, and what they're doing and maybe um, helped you gain a little bit uh, more understanding or awareness of um, the individuals who are possibly creating some of the, the content that you consume on a regular basis. Um, I hope you enjoyed that assignment. I know it's kind of a written assignment in the cinematography class, but uh, given that it's usually the first assignment that I that I ask of my students, um, I think it, it serves as kind of a, uh, to break the ice uh, with us in class and also to start getting you thinking specifically in terms of how the images are created and who those individuals might be who are responsible. <clears throat> um, Section 1.3, uh, I started uh, breaking down the components of the camera department in terms of individuals, their job descriptions, um, the individual concerns of each of these uh, people on the camera team. And so we talked about the DP uh, being the, uh, the, the overall head of the department. And I think you could think of the cinematographer or the director of photography as sort of the, the liaison between um, the director and the producers and their overarching goals. Um, and then the, uh, the, the um, execution of the narrative uh, by the crew and your DP is sort of working in between to uh, manage all of the uh, requirements and the necessities and the ambitions of each of the individual departments and their department heads, all in service to uh, the vision uh, set forth by the director. Um, the camera operator uh, is a unique position. I think you've probably heard me say this uh, more than once. The camera operator's got the best job on the set. Um, that individual is typically um, solely responsible for the supervision of the images as they are created in camera by means of composition, lensing, um, camera movement, uh, and so forth. Um, outside of the auspices of focus and basic maintenance of the equipment and basic setup and, um, and deployment of the equipment, which falls under the uh, jurisdiction of the assistant camera people at this point. So the camera operator is simply there to lens each shot, discuss the mechanics of the shot compositionally with the director and the director of photography, and to help those two individuals work out the nuance of creating shots that serve uh, the narrative that will edit well together. Um, the camera operator is mostly focused on the compositional aspects, the aesthetic aspects of the frame. And then that individual is supported by uh, a number of um, assistant camera people, the first assistant camera, the second assistant camera, a utility person in the department, and then possibly the digital imaging technician. Okay, so the first AC is the individual whose specific duty, their, their main, their key role, of course, is 
maintaining focus uh, in each of the shots done manually and done independently of the camera operator's responsibilities. So many times the first AC is focusing a shot as it happens in camera uh, without uh, necessarily uh, given the aid of, um, uh, of an inspection monitor or the ability to uh, witness the shot as it unfolds through the viewing system. The, the first assistant camera has to be able to function independently of those visual aids and yet still manage to maintain uh, precision of focus um, as well as executing all of the other settings required uh, so that the camera can produce uh, well exposed uh, images. Um, for our final product. Um, the first AC is supported by the second AC and that individual's job, um, not solely, but it seems to be the, the major portion of that individual's job is the clerical execution of all footage that is created in camera um, by logging uh, each shot using the slate as an ID system of visual ID system, and then a, a, a system of camera reports with all of the specific information for each particular shot that is created uh, and captured, uh, which then has to go to the editors for final uh, uh, integration into uh, the final edit. So the second AC is keeping track of all of the clips that are created, giving them names, uh, adding metadata, uh, for instance, um, any of the exposure information that was taken uh, at the time the image was created, uh, lens size, uh, uh, aperture uh, settings, um, ISO settings on the camera, any, any of the notes specific to uh, the settings that were used to create each of those shots. Uh, and then the scene number, take number, uh, and whether or not those takes are favorable or, uh, or not on the part of the director. All of that information is being managed by the second AC. Um, those are the broad, uh, <clears throat> the broad descriptions of each of these individuals and their key duties within the department. They're also basically um, equally consigned to the responsibility of making sure that the cameras um, are uh, transported and stored properly, that they're cleaned and maintained effectively, um, that all of the equipment is serviced when necessary. Um, if, if equipment is uh, rented on a daily basis and not a run of show basis, they're also responsible for the uh, sending and receiving of what we call daily hire equipment, special lenses or, or uh, support systems that we might need uh, on a temporary basis through the course of a shoot, not necessarily on the day-to-day -day basis. And so the first AC and the second AC are also responsible for the manage, management of the equipment package in general. Uh, and how it's used and handled throughout the course of a production. If a, f a production is fortunate enough to have a utility person, that person may be described as a loader on a film shoot or as a, uh, a digital asset manager on a digital film shoot. This individual is uh, in support of the second AC. Uh, if the second AC has to produce a second camera for a particular shot and has to bump up to a B camera focus puller, camera utility person then steps up and assumes the responsibilities of the second AC. So it's kind of like having an additional second AC on staff uh, who's kind of doing the asset management, whether it's on film or on digital, keeping track of uh, data cards, uh, keeping track of exposed rolls of film processing, uh, or packaging film rather to be sent to the lab for processing or uh, cloning, cataloging, and distributing digital files um, uh, on a digital film shoot. So this kind of uh, is a luxury on a lot of lower budget productions, uh, larger budget film and television usually um, uh, provides for this individual on the camera crew that can be a very handy uh, addition to any camera team. And this is also considered an entry level position. So many of you who are interested in seeking jobs as camera assistants when you get out of school uh, might consider uh, applying for camera utility positions on uh, film and television uh, projects uh, as an entry level individual. This is where you're gonna learn the, the ins and outs of the entire department. Um, you'll get 
a certain amount of responsibility in that you'll be handling um, volatile assets uh, that are created within the department, namely uh, the exposed film stock or the uh, digital assets, the files themselves. Uh, but in all other aspects, you would be learning um, each of the job descriptions of the individuals who are, are functioning in the department with you and, and helping to oversee you uh, in your job performance. So this is a really good um, position. Uh, we consider that an entry level position in the, uh, in the feature world. Concurrently in the camera department, we now have, uh, especially on digital uh, film shoots, we have now the digital imaging technician. Uh, and this person has a fairly specific role um, initially uh, in the industry, the DIT was um, somebody who um, could do some basic uh, color corrections. We call it black box or paint box uh, adjustments uh, on digital video shoots. Uh, but on film shoots, a digital imaging technician really wasn't present uh, until the age of the digital intermediate process where we could shoot film uh, as our initial capture media uh, but then all of that content was going to be transferred uh, or scanned into digital files and go through a digital workflow in post-production. Uh, in those cases, the digital imaging technician is now on set oftentimes to take raw files or um, files that have no um, color correction uh, aspects uh, incorporated in their original uh, recording and apply what we call lookup tables to those images so that people like directors and producers can be on set and they can be looking at an image on a monitor that will reflect something close to the final result or the expected result that the images will have once they're through the post-production pipeline and they've been color corrected and had um, uh, perhaps uh, digital effects like wire removal or uh, green screen replacement um, uh, added later. So the DIT now has sort of an expanded role uh, on the digital film set, uh, helping us process data files, cloning hard drives, making sure that um, copies of all assets created on a daily basis get disseminated to each of the parties uh, concerned like the producers, the production manager, the editors, uh, post-production supervisors, and colorists uh, who also need access to the materials that are created daily uh, because they need to uh, offer their own sort of um, affectation to the files, whether it's color correction or uh, whether it's um, uh, clip conforming uh, for the editors, whatever that, whatever the case may be, the digital imaging technician now has a much broader, more expanded role uh, in production. I want to see if I can just open up my um, uh, my keynotes real quick here and see if there are any cells specifically that might have been utilized in class that we might want to take a look at real quick. Uh, so this is what week three, I think. And so keynote would have looked something like this. So we talked about all the different individuals, um, the role that each of these individuals is playing uh, on the set. Uh, from the operators to the DPs to the assistants and so forth. We talked about, um, this was interesting, the first AC's toolkit. There was an interesting video here. You can access that on web courses, talking about the types of things that a camera assistant might have in their set ditty bag, um, things that'll make the job uh, easier uh, to execute in terms of a focus puller or a second AC. We also talked about the proper uh, uh, way to uh, to slate uh, or to ID uh, at the head of every clip that we take on set. Does anybody remember the rule of thumb that I gave you folks about um, slating uh, or putting the head IDs on each of the clips in terms of um, you know how you want to execute it, where you want to hold it, and so forth? Do you remember the discussions that we had about that? I don't, uh, I don't see you guys in my Zoom window, so I'm going to assume that uh, we don't have 
uh, any feedback? Is that is that right? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So the rule of thumb uh, when you're executing a head ID, so here's a second AC, for instance, he's offering up a slate uh, on this particular production. Um, I don't know where the shot came from. I just pulled this off of uh, off of uh, the internet. But um, when I was the second AC, we had a rule of thumb and that was uh, for every 10 millimeters on the lens, we would be a foot away from the camera. So on a 10 millimeter lens, you're only gonna be a foot away from the camera when you execute your head ID. In other words, when you uh, slap the sticks for the camera uh, when they roll record. Uh, and that's because a 10 millimeter is a, an extreme wide angle lens. And so if you're standing 10 feet away from the camera on a 10 millimeter lens, the slate's gonna be a very small aspect of the overall image. And it's kind of hard for the editors to see what's going on. Um, it's a little easier with digital NLEs. Now we can just sort of magnify our viewing window and we can take a look at fine details or pixel peep, if you will. Um, but when you're talking about a film production, for instance, um, and the editors don't quite have that kind of flexibility in a film post-production pipeline, um, you want to get that slate as big as you can in the frame. So on a 10 millimeter lens, you only need to be about a foot, foot and a half away from the lens in order to get the entire slate to fill the frame. Uh, and then you move back a, a foot or a little over a foot for each 10 millimeters on the lens. So 20 millimeter lens, you're going to slate it at about two, three feet away, 50 millimeter lens, about five feet away and so forth. 85 millimeter lens about eight feet away. And by following that basic rule of thumb, you can get the slate nice and big in the frame at the beginning of each clip. So the editors can't miss it when they're looking for uh, scene numbers and take numbers uh, in bins in hard drives or literally in bins of film clips in post-production and they're looking for a specific piece of film. This becomes a really important aspect of the identification process for the editors specifically. That's really what this whole responsibility is all about. Making sure that every piece of film that we shoot or every clip that we commit to camera has at least, at the very least, this minimal amount of metadata associated with that clip so that we can differentiate different clips in post-production very quickly, okay? Uh, I did give you a video on how to execute um, slating properly. That is on web courses under your videos tab. Um, of course, Ryan Connolly uh, gave us uh, a video we watched in class about the duties of the second AC and basically how to slate. Um, this is a breakdown. Um, if we look at, um, for instance, I think this ended up being called the social network, right? Uh, working title was the Facebook movie. Um, this is what a basically a, a slate is going to look like. So you have your roll number. This is a uh, roll number is really associated with a film uh, production process. If it's a digital process, it might be a uh, card number instead of roll number. Um, and then you'll have, you know, whatever card number you have. And a running total, I think, is the wisest way to do this instead of on a day by day basis. Uh, when we used to shoot film in, in my day when I was a camera assistant, I think we would do about anywhere between seven and say 13 1000 foot rolls of film per day, which is anywhere between uh, say you get about 11 minutes and, and f what about 11 minutes and 40 seconds on a roll of uh, film stock. So that's, you know, roughly 70, 75 uh, minutes to uh, uh, to much longer uh, when you're talking about thousand foot rolls of film. But if you're talking about digital asset media cards, uh, you might have card number here and you still might shoot, you know, two or three cards per day. <coughs> I know that some folks, especially YouTube content creators and folks that shoot long form video like to have big uh, memory cards that have large recording capacities and they use like to use one card uh, over the course of a day shooting. Uh, I've never been an advocate of that because if anything ever were to happen to that digital media card, for instance, uh, and your entire day's work is on only one card, then you could potentially lose 
an entire day's work um, in light of, uh, you know, an accident like a card getting accidentally formatted or uh, having a card get lost. Uh, some of the media cards that we use, the little SD cards are really tiny and they could easily uh, fall out of a ditty bag on location and become uh, unretrievable or lost. Um, they're also very easy to, you know, very quickly um, uh, erase a card or uh, format a card. And then of course, all that data is gone. So um, it's, uh, it's really important, I think, to use more than one uh, media card or more than one roll of film, obviously, uh, so that if you do lose one particular uh, card for some reason like that, an unfortunate accident, you don't lose your entire day's work, you only lose whatever media was on that specific card. So for that reason, I tend to shoot cards that have the same recording duration as a role of film had in the era of film acquisition. So if a role of motion picture stock, 35 millimeter motion picture stock, a thousand feet, we would say in, in broad and in, in estimated terms was 10 minutes of recording time. I like to use data cards that have about the same amount of recording time for whatever um, resolution and compression that I'm dealing with. So if I'm shooting raw video, for instance, at 4K, um, I want to make sure that my data cards can handle uh, uncompressed 4K image files for a total recording time of 10 minutes. And in some cases, with most of the cameras that I tend to use, that, that can be accomplished with, say, a, a 64 or 128 gigabyte card, right? So you'll never see me using a uh, a 256 gig data card or a 512 gig data card or a terabyte data card. I don't, I don't believe in that. It worries me. I don't like to have all of my assets on one card that could be easily destroyed. So I like to break it down in smaller bytes. And I think that's um, a fairly common practice industry wide. Uh, but back to the slate, uh, if we can talk about uh, the other information that's here. Uh, so we have our role or media card number. We have our scene number, okay? And this happens to be scene 27 Delta or 27 David. Um, this is a piece of coverage within a broader scene 27. Uh, and then look at this, take 16 of uh, clip 27 Delta uh, or 27 David. Um, this guy's doing 16 takes. He's, he's up there in the Kubrick uh, <laughs> realm of... 16, 17 uh, takes per, per clip. Um, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but um, that was, that's what this number is indicating. How many times did you reshoot this piece of film in order to get one in the can that the director liked, what we would call a circle take? Uh, 16 would be uh, <laughs> at the extreme end of that, of, of that scale. Uh, listed on the front of the slate is the film's director and then the, the director of photography and then some, some specifics here, the date that the particular scene was shot, uh, whether it was day or night. Uh, also on um, most industry standard slates, there will be an interior exterior uh, indicator as well. And then this is sync sound or non-sync sound uh, recording. And then uh, on all of my slates that I used to use, there was also an extra section here that would indicate whether or not we were using any kind of on-camera filtration. So all that information could be present on the slate. Uh, the second AC is taking care of all, managing all of this information. Does anybody else, does anybody remember who else is concerned with all this information on the slate uh, that gets recorded at the head of every clip? Do you guys remember who that person might be? The editor. Yes, <laughs> that would be true. Uh, the editor is definitely uh, concerned with this information, but there's somebody on set on a daily basis working with the shooting crew who is also tracking all of this information. Do you remember who that individual was? Very important to know if you're a second AC. Do you guys remember me mentioning the script supervisor? The script supervisor is working on set every day with the rest of the film crew. Uh, and that individual is also tracking how many rolls of film are shot per day, what scenes are shot on a daily basis, uh, how many takes of each shot are done, 
uh, all of the day's work um, and is tracking all that information as well. This information is also present in another document on set that you would have learned about in your introduction to production class. So does anybody remember the document that we rely on when we are executing the day's work? There's going to be a document that we have that tells us what 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 work are we doing today, for instance. What document is that? Do you remember? Anybody? Do you guys remember uh, learning about the call sheet? The call sheet is basically the work order for a given day of shooting on a production. So the assistant directors are creating these things, these call sheets. Uh, each night, uh, the call sheet is um, produced, printed up on uh, hard copy and handed out to the crew as they are wrapping up the day's work and heading home for the evening. And that call sheet will be basically the work order for the following day. So Valley Medical Center. Oops, sorry about that, folks. So scenes like 27 uh, would be listed on a call sheet. And on that call sheet, we'd have the scene description, the scene number, uh, the actors involved in that scene, basically what's happening is a brief note about what's happening in that scene. And there might be three or four scenes that have to be accomplished in the course of a shooting day. Okay, so the call sheet is sort of giving us uh, the things that we need to shoot that day from the script, what scenes are we shooting, the location and so forth. Um, it'll give us the scene numbers and then those scene numbers are what's gonna go on the slate. And we'll usually start with the master shot. So in this case, scene 27 would have been 27 master. Um, and then we do our coverage. Coverage is generally not listed on a call sheet. Coverage is something that the director has in mind. In other words, all the pieces the director wants to shoot within a given scene number, um, all the different angles that they're gonna wanna cut together to craft that finished scene for the movie. But on the call sheet, it'll just say, for instance, scenes 26, 27, 28, and 29, let's say. Uh, and so that's where we get these numbers from. Initially, we start with the master shot of the first scene on the call sheet, and then each person, the script supervisor and the second AC are tracking that information uh, on the slate as we commit shots to camera okay so that's basically the you know the crux of what's going on with the slate it's really got a lot uh, there's a lot going on uh, concerning the slate um it's a very integral part of the process and i think that sometimes folks sort of discount it as merely being uh the act of slapping the sticks together and creating a uh, an audible sync point for the editors but it really is uh a great deal more than that if you get down to it on a granular level. <coughs> this is the, the uh, ID um, from the video, how to slate properly. That's on web courses for you to check out. Um, I think that basically um, covers, uh, I'll cover the DIT again a little bit later. This is uh, a digital imaging technician uh, on a TV show out in LA. And, and basically you can see here, He's got a couple of monitors on his little cart off to the side on set. Uh, this monitor over here is showing him what we call a color parade. He's looking at the, uh, the video signal itself in terms of its strength uh, of, of the signal. Uh, he's also looking at the color corrective uh, uh, aspects of uh, the video uh, file through a vector scope or waveform monitor. And then he's probably applying a lookup table, which is a basic set of color correction parameters that can be, if you will, mapped over the video that's coming out of the camera in a non-destructive way. So that if you get a, if you get a flat, um, uncompressed and uncorrected video signal coming out of the camera, it's going to it's going to look really crappy on a monitor without a lookup table applied to it. And the DIT will apply those uh, those lookup tables to the image. So we get a basic sense of the color correction, the color saturation, 
uh, and so forth that's happening in a particular video image so that the director can really kind of see what the finished image is going to look like, even though it's a non-destructive process. It's a, it's a set of um, uh, metadata that can be removed, uh, placed on or removed from a video file uh, in such a way to give us an inspection uh, verification of what we have, but it doesn't interfere with the uh, the actual clip itself in terms of the image data in that clip that's been created. Uh, it's just a reference file that can be put on a clip so we can see what what's going on in terms of what the editors might do later in terms of color correction or or post effects or whatnot. Um, and then we talked about the camera PA. So here's another uh, entry level position in the camera department. Uh, the camera production assistant. Um, this is kind of rare uh, on uh, bigger budget movies because the unions uh, sort of frown on uh, non-card holding individuals uh, working within a given department. But on uh, any of your non-union uh, feature production or television productions, a lot of times you'll find uh, a camera production assistant position open. Uh, and this is also an entry level position. This is an individual who might be uh, a, f a student at a local film school where this production is being shot uh, and they're there to learn from the working professionals and to help out um, in, um, in sort of non-obtrusive ways uh, and, and learn the craft of uh, working in the camera department uh, from the point of view of a professional production. So um, you might find these types of positions uh, uh, accessible to you or available in Orlando or in Atlanta. Uh, where there's a, a number of sort of non-union um, productions taking place. Uh, not so much in Los Angeles or New York, though. That's a little bit, bit of a different story. Um, that was section 1.3. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or questions about section 1.3, or should I move on, uh, keep forging ahead? I think this is a fairly... Uh, simple module, not not terribly complicated. Um, so I'm going to move on then to module 1.4. So 1.4 got a little bit a little bit sticky. In 1.4, uh, I think the, the main takeaway from this section was talking about uh, recording media, the different types of media that are out there, uh, and how you determine um, your recording time on a particular uh, media card or on a particular roll of film, for instance. Uh, film's a little bit easier to in, uh, interpret. We only have two different sizes of film stocks, 400 foot rolls and 1000 foot rolls uh, for the most part. Uh, 35 millimeter, 1000 footer is a standard uh, narrative roll of film. It's 10, 10 minutes of possible recording time. Uh, 400 footers are reserved for handheld uh, build configurations on film cameras uh, and you don't get nearly as much recording time but the magazine is smaller and lighter uh, and makes it easier for a camera operator to shoulder a film camera with a 400 foot magazine as opposed to a thousand foot magazine so the thousand footers are the magazines we're going to put on for the normal day-to-day -day, uh, dialogue recording on a film shoot uh, it's a much bigger magazine um, heavier uh, and so when the camera's on the dolly or when the camera's on a tripod, there's generally a thousand foot mag on the camera. And that's pretty, pretty simple. 16 millimeter, uh, there's only one size of film, practically speaking, uh, in professional 16 millimeter film acquisition, and that would be the 400 foot load. Um, you can get smaller load, 100 foot daylight loads and so forth for like your Bolex cameras and so forth. But if you're talking about like shooting on The Walking Dead, for instance, where they're using Flex. Uh, 16 SR cameras, they're going to be using 400 foot uh, camera loads uh, in 16 millimeter, which gives you about the same amount of recording time as a thousand foot roll of film in 35 millimeter. Um, but digital is a whole different ball game. So in digital, not only do we have several different kinds of uh, media cards, but we have all of these uh, different recording capacities. If I go to my um, keynote for section 1.4 we can look at uh, all the different sizes uh, of media card that are out there 
uh, and basically what the um, recording times are going to be. I think I also added in this conversation a little bit of discussion about aspect ratio um, for presentation and for acquisition. I think we kind of, over the course of the semester, get a pretty good sense of, of what this is. Um, uh, 185 theatrical presentation uh, aspect ratio, 133 used to be the, um, the aspect ratio of uh, standard definition television. Uh, now we're out to something like 178 to 1 for uh, HD uh, TV presentation and 185 for standard theatrical presentation. And then you get your 235 to 1 aspect ratio, which is your widest uh, rectangle out here, which is your widescreen theatrical presentations. So some movies like um, Lord of the Rings or Blade Runner 2049 or um, Dune uh, are going to be offered in these widescreen presentation formats, these, these wide 235 or 239 aspect ratios, uh, because it creates a, a much more impressive spectacle in a theater to look at a screen that that's that big and the having the 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 um, the vistas be that wide in your field of view is, is very impressive and makes for uh, makes for um, an enjoyable film going experience. But if we're talking about standard uh, projection, standard television uh, exhibition, we're looking at one seven eight or one eight five to one, which is this narrow or gray rectangle in the middle here. And all these different presentation formats, I kind of illustrated to you the different ways that we have monitors or screens that we're looking at these different, um, these different aspect ratios. Um, anybody remember what these black bars are called? You remember the term letterboxing, letterbox? Okay, if you have a television presentation medium like uh, your TV screen at home, um, this happens to be a 4-3 aspect ratio screen. This might be like a computer monitor screen. Um, if you have a wide format image file and you want to display it on a screen that has a different aspect ratio, you're going to have to uh, add letterboxing to your image file if you want it to fill the frame corner to corner. Some TVs will do this automatically. For instance, if you put a widescreen um, DVD or Blu-ray uh, into your player and play it on your um, 16 by 9 television at home, uh, because the image file is a widescreen image file, the, uh, the TV will automatically letterbox the top and bottom for you so that you can see the full frame without any cropping left and right. Um, that might happen if you were to take this aspect ratio and blow it up and expand it into the size of the screen. Uh, because then you would start losing some image detail to the left and to the right. Um, when we, in the days when we shot standard definition video or when we had one three three to one aspect ratio for television, our images were actually more square. They were more uh, this shape. And so if you have a piece of content that was created, say, 15 years ago and you find it on a hard drive, maybe you're cutting a documentary together with some source material or something that was created uh, 10 or 15 years previous, uh, you play it on your 16 by 9 monitor, you're going to have to letterbox uh, in this fashion uh, in order to see the full image file corner to corner on your uh, new television screen, which has a wider presentation aspect ratio. So here's a 16 by 9 TV like you might have in your living room or at your office if you're an editor. And this might be the way the image was created initially in a standard definition camera, say a video camera, for instance. And you might have to cut this together with other content created more recently in the context of, of the same project file uh, and just add the letterboxing here. If you expand this frame out to fill the 16 by 9 corner to corner, you'll start losing information, image information at the top and the bottom of your image file. Uh, which can, in essence, crop the video image, which is not always something that we want to do. So um, that was the gist of the conversation in terms of aspect ratio and presentation uh, ratio. I talked about the Grand Budapest Hotel um, and the fact that uh, Wes Anderson shot in three different aspect ratios in the course of the same movie um, as sort of an homage or a tribute to the history of film. 
some of the scenes were shot in traditional 185 theatrical aspect ratio uh, and then composed to fit those rectangles. And then in some cases, uh, images were shot in the traditional, what we call the old academy aspect ratio or the 133 for TV aspect ratio for compositions that were more vertical and less rectangular or less horizontal in nature. <laughs> Uh, here's a shot inside the rail car, for instance, Lobby Boy and um, and uh, Mr. Gustav, and it was shot in the Academy 137 aspect ratio. And other scenes in the movie, like uh, the interview uh, with Mr. Gustav as an older man uh, being interviewed by, um, I forget this character's name, uh, but they're in the grand ballroom and he's talking to him about the history of the hotel and how he first got started working there. And Wes thought that the wide presentation aspect ratio of 239 in terms of digital or 235 in terms of film would be appropriate given the art direction of the room itself. You see how you got all these sort of repeating elements, the doors in the background, the, um, the wall sconces, uh, the tables and chairs. And we look in this wide shot here, you can see there's a, there's, um, a lot of architecture and things that seem to play well in this wider rectangle. And so for scenes like this, they shot in the, uh, in the widescreen presentation format, just to give the audience a, a sense of the hotel uh, as a character in the movie uh, with equal sort of equal standing uh, and screen time as the characters themselves. So I think it's kind of an interesting film in that regard. If you, if you get a chance to watch the film Again, you may have seen it before and watched it simply for the entertainment value, but if you go back and watch it again and look at the film and, and look for these specific changes in aspect ratio and take note of when and where uh, um, Wes Anderson might have elected to do that and see if you can sort of wrap your head around what he was thinking about when he went from one aspect ratio to the other. Um, our sensors. Are, we talked about the sensors also having uh, aspect ratio um, built into them for a variety of reasons. In Cinematography One, I don't go too deep in the weeds about that, except to say that uh, different cameras may have different size sensors with different um, recording aspect ratios uh, incorporated in them. Um, but each of these, whether this is, for instance, an APS-C sensor in a uh, Canon 60D, for instance, versus a full frame sensor in a Canon 5D or Sony a7 III, for instance. Um, each of these will have similar resolution characteristics like 1080p or, uh, or, or more 4K, sometimes even 6K resolution, but have different recording aspect ratios in the context of the chip itself. And that'll have to do with um, certain proprietary aspects that the manufacturer uh, has in mind for that sensor, not just the image uh, itself that's being created by the sensor, but other uh, forms of, for instance, metadata uh, that have to go uh, with each uh, frame of video that's shot by a camera like this. So the sensors may have different sizes, but they're going to share characteristics like resolution um, uh, despite their, their inherent aspect ratio. Um, I talked about um, different sensor sizes and their comparative sizes one to another. Um, the full frame sensor, if we could uh, see that represented in orange here, um, that's showing you the full size of a sensor, for instance, in a Canon 5D, 24 millimeters high by 36 millimeters wide. That's the physical size of the sensor itself. And in comparison, you can see the size of a sensor, for instance, in your 7D or your 60D from Canon. Um, APS-C is also um, the relative size of the Super 35 sensor that we see in the um, Blackmagic Ursa Mini 4.6K that you guys have at UCF. Um, also in relative comparison, we have here this green rectangle, uh, which is the um, Micro Four Thirds sensor that you might see in a, for instance, a Panasonic uh, GH5 uh, or the new GH6. 
And then all the way down here in the lower right corner, we got this little tiny blue guy down here. This is in relationship to the full frame sensor. This is about the relative size comparison of the sensor in your cell phone. So you can see that even though both of these sensors, for instance, uh, let's say you've got a full frame sensor and a, and a Sony a7 III, uh, and you're shooting 4K video. You're also shooting 4K video in your cell phone, but you're using a sensor that's only this big. So we talked about what some of the possible drawbacks of that might be. Um, and it generally has to do with the low light performance characteristics of a sensor. So a sensor that is fairly big, has fairly big um, what we call um, pixel sites uh, on the sensor itself, the actual uh, lenses and RGB sensors on the imager that are creating the image itself. And so a sensor that's really, really small has really small uh, image sites and a larger sensor will have bigger image sites and the bigger image sites generally perform better in low light. So a lot of times what you'll see is a cell phone that will take a really great picture during the day, but not so good at nighttime. Uh, and if you're shooting video uh, in low light situations, you might want a camera with a larger sensor like a Sony a7 III or uh, Red Monstro or Z camera F6 or F8. Um, the new Canon C700, I believe is also a full frame uh, camera. Um, and the Sony Venice uh, production camera is also full frame uh, sensor camera. So they are out there. Um, and these are these are this is basically a rough size comparison uh, between the different brands. This was another visual to show you basically um, what's going on. This has more to do with um, relative sensor size versus uh, lens focal length. We talked about um, a smaller uh, sensor size isolating uh, a more central region on an image file that might be. Uh, that might have a different field of view on a different camera. For instance, this outer orange box represents what you might see on a full frame sensor in a Canon 5D, for instance. Um, and on a different camera, like for instance, a Panasonic GH5 with the same 50 millimeter lens, you might only see this much of the actual image in the field of view because the sensor is much, much smaller. So the Canon uh, 5D gives you a 50 millimeter point of view. Um, and then when you put that same lens on a Panasonic GH5, it will appear to have double the focal length or twice the magnification, because you're seeing less of the image circle that is projected by the lens itself. So that's kind of a comparison. Um, uh, you know, the as, as in terms of an illustration graphic, it requires a great deal of, I think, explanation. But it's just giving you a sense of the comparative size differences of uh, micro four thirds, for instance, versus full frame versus your cell phone, okay? Uh, I showed you the different cameras that you guys have at UCF uh, in your, um, in your uh, equipment room, uh, Canon 5Ds. We don't have Sony's at UCF, but we do have Canon 5Ds uh, with full frame sensors, the Ursa Mini, uh, in relative comparison, has a super 35 sensor. You can see it's slightly smaller than that uh, in the Canon 5D. Um, they don't have uh, EOS cinema cameras at UCF, but they do have now uh, the Pocket 6K, which has a sensor about the size of the Ursa Mini. This is the Pocket 4K, which has a micro four third sensor, and it is the same size as the Panasonic GH5. Uh, on the other hand, your pocket, your original OG, if you will, the original gangster pocket camera, the HD version, has a very small image sensor, smaller than micro four thirds even. The actual sensor is a micro four thirds sensor and the mount itself is referred to as a micro four thirds uh, lens flange. But the usable area on the sensor, you'll notice how part of the sensor is dark blue and part of the sensor is light green. Uh, the light green portion of this sensor in the original Blackmagic Pocket is the active portion of the sensor. The rest of this is all metadata and 
data that's not used in the final image file. So the usable size of the image field on the micro four thirds sensor in the original pocket camera is quite small. Uh, so a 50 millimeter lens uh, on the Canon 7D, for instance, uh, will have a different field of view uh, than the same lens on the pocket cinema camera, the original pocket cinema camera, because less of that image circle is being recorded as image file. You see that? Um, if we can get back to the conversation about data cards, though, the big takeaway from this particular lecture was all about media and what size card do you need, what the different kinds of data cards are in the digital acquisition realm. I gave you a pretty handy video. That's not it. It's this guy down here. If you look for this uh, keyframe uh, on your video thumbnails on your web courses video page, this video is talking about the different um, recording cards that are available, the different cards that you might find in the different cameras that we use, uh, for instance, even at UCF. So if we're talking about the cameras available at UCF, for instance, um, your Canon 5Ds are using your um, CFAST cards. Um, your Ursa Minis are using CFAST cards. Your pocket cinema cameras are using SD cards. Your Lumix cameras are using SD cards. So you do have the FZ1000s at UCF. Uh, and those are going to take the SD cards, for instance. Uh, some of the cameras have uh, USB 3 um, uh, external data ports, and you can use external uh, solid state uh, recording devices like the Samsung SSD. Uh, and I think we have those for the Pocket 6K. Uh, the file sizes coming out of the Pocket 6K camera are so big because of the 6K resolution that. Um, it's not really, um, it's not really practical to use 128 gigabyte uh, CFast card, for instance, uh, in a pocket 6K because you'd get maybe four minutes of recording time in 6K and then you'd have to change cards. So the SSD cards, uh, like this one, I think is a two terabyte SSD. Um, you can fit a lot more data from higher resolution cameras on an external SSD recorder. So in some cases, you might not be using a card at all. You'll be using a solid state recording device. Um, we talked about uh, the naming conventions for the different media cards. And I used the, uh, the SD card specifically because they seem to be the best in terms of all of the information that's present on this card that describes to you exactly what this card uh, is capable of doing how it how it will perform in your recording device. You can see how the CFast cards leave a little bit of uh, a little bit to be desired in terms of all the different information. It's a little harder to read in some cases, not all illustrated on the on the labeling of the CFast card. And certainly the SSD doesn't have really any information uh, on the device itself. You have to look into the um, the um, documents or the instructions that come with the SSD to find out what the recording characteristics are. So the SD cards are the ones that are the easiest to interpret. So we had a little um, uh, a little homework assignment. You guys did a worksheet where you had to um, tell me what each one of these specific um, references was on the SD card and and what information it was trying to tell you. Can anybody here tell me what's the total recording capacity of this card? Anybody? 128 gigs. 128 gigs, total recording capacity, that's correct. Okay. Um, it's a SanDisk Extreme, so that's the model of the card. Um, it's going to have two different speed. This card's going to have two different speed limits. It's going to have a speed limit for how fast it can write data to the card, and it's going to have a speed limit on how fast data can be read from the card. Okay, so we call that a read speed and a write speed. Okay, so. Up here in this corner of the card, you see 45 megabytes per second. Is that a read speed or a write speed? Any 
Anybody? Read speed. That is a read speed. That's correct. So 45 megabytes per second is how fast data can be extracted from this card once it's been recorded to the card. 45 megabytes per second. Now, we talked about megabytes per second in class, and we talked about there's a little bit of a problem when we talk about data cards and megabytes per second. And that is that the cameras and their specifications are described in terms of how fast they can record data. And that is, that is referred to in megabits per second, right? So if we have a 45 megabytes per second read speed on this card, there's a megabits per second uh, associated with it, and there's a there's a factor of eight times, I think it is. So there's eight bits to a byte. So if we have 45 megabytes per second, if we multiply that 45 by eight, that'll tell us how many megabits per second we can read off that card at one time. Does anybody have a calculator? What's 45 times eight? 45 times eight, we're looking at 360 megabits per second read speed off the card. That's pretty good. The problem is that has nothing to do with how fast we can record data to the card, right? So there was a different way that we had to look at and interpret the information on this card to figure out how fast we could record data to the card. And we had to do that in kind of a two-step process. So here's another extreme pro card. This one's a little bit different than this illustration. There's something fundamentally different Unknown column. in the nomenclature of this card versus the nomenclature of this card. And if you look really closely at the two cards, right, you'll see that the difference is right in here. Okay. So this is a data card that is meant to be shot in one of the newer digital video cinema cameras, okay? This is an SD card that was probably made 10 years ago, and it's a secure digital SD extreme capacity card. So we know that it has um, 128 gigabytes is considered extreme capacity. 32 gigabytes is considered high capacity. Uh, and that really refers to simply the storage of the card itself. But on this card, we have the same read speed limit listed here. We have secure digital XC. We know that because 128 gigs. But then we have V30 and then we have series one here. Okay. And this information is what we need to know if we need to know how fast we can record data to this card. This is telling us how fast we can get the data off the card. But this is telling us how fast we can put the data on the card, okay? And you notice that it has a little V30 designation right here. If I make that bigger so you can see, you see this V30 right here? So the V stands for video, okay? So we know that this is a SanDisk Extreme Pro SD card specifically meant for video recording, and it has a V30 designation, okay? The V30 designation has to do with megabytes per second record speed. And again, megabytes per second, and the cameras are speaking in megabits per second. So we have to take this number and we have to multiply it by eight. And when we do that, we see that we can record to this card at a rate of 240 megabits per second, okay? And that's an important piece of information but it's still not gonna tell us exactly how much time we can get on this card. We have to know something else. Does anybody remember what that other factor is that we have to be aware of before we can determine how much record time we have on a card? Do you guys remember what that, that piece of information is and where to find it? Any camera that you're going to use, and these are some of the cameras that are available to you at UCF, is going to have what we call a bit rate associated with it. Okay, that's how fast the camera can record data to its media card. Okay, and 
in most cases, the bit rate will change based on the resolution of the file you're creating and the frame rate of the file that you're, the clip that you're shooting. Uh, and in some cases, the duration of the clip, but not so much uh, as, the other, as the other two factors, frame rate and resolution. Okay, but let's just say for, uh, for the sake of argument in HD, the Canon 60D, uh, which you guys have a number of at UCF, records HD at a rate of 46 megabits per second, okay? And creates MP4 compressed file, okay? Uh, your pocket cinema camera, your Blackmagic is also 45 megabits per second. In ProRes proxy compression, if you're recording in ProRes HQ compression, see how the megabits per second goes up to 180, okay? There's more resolution uh, inherent in a ProRes HQ file than there is in a ProRes proxy file. There's a lot of compression uh, in a ProRes proxy file. And so the bit rate doesn't have to be as high, it can be 45. But when you're talking about getting the full impact, the full color saturation of full resolution capable, capable in a ProRes HQ file in HD, we need 180 megabits per second uh, allocated for this camera in that compression mode. So at 180 megabits per second, you can see how a V30 Pro card that can record at 240 megabits per second, this would be an acceptable card to use in the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. But you might have a problem if we started talking about, for instance, the pocket 4k camera okay which you guys don't have 4ks that you you said but you got the pocket 6k cameras okay so a pocket 6k camera is going to record uh the same pro res at 480 megabytes per second peak okay so at the highest resolution and the highest frame rate 483 megabytes per second megabytes per second if we change that to megabits, it's going to look real crazy. 483 times 8. Your Pocket 6K is recording at 3,800 megabits per second. So <laughs> that should tell you pretty quickly that you're not going to use this card in a Pocket 6K camera. Even though I think there's an SD card slot, you would need uh, something like an Angelbird high-capacity, high-speed card to use in the Pocket 6K. The Pocket 4K, on the other hand, is anything from 255 to 270 megabits per second in ProRes HQ in 4K. This is a little bit more economical uh, data consumption on the part of the Pocket 4K. Now, the Pocket 4K has an SD slot and a CFast slot. And in the Blackmagic um, ecosystem, if you go on their website, or if you look in the instructions to the Pocket 4K, you'll find that you can record most things uh, on an SD card on the in the Pocket 4K, as long as you don't go above 24 frames per second. The minute you go to high speed recording, especially in 4K, you can no longer use the SD cards, you have to go to see fast cards, because they're going to have a faster data rate. If I go way back here to the CFAST and the and the SD comparison, you'll see this CFAST card will write at 450 megabytes per second. All right, you could use this in the 6K pocket camera. You'd also need to use this in the 4K pocket if you were going to record 4K 60P, for instance. You'd have to use a CFAST card because of the bit rate. Okay. So uh the discussion about bit rate and data cards is really, really important because it's going to determine how much record time you're going to have, for instance, on this 120 gigabyte card. 120 gigabytes has to translate into a minutes or seconds recording capacity in order for you to really get a sense of how much video you can put on this card, right? So we have a little formula that I showed that I showed you guys, which can help you sort of determine your recording times on a given card, okay? And that is the total capacity of the card is equal in minutes to the card capacity in gigabytes times 1,024 
times eight divided by the camera's bit rate and 60. And so these all have specific uh, um, references. I gave you a little example here. So to find out the bit rate of your camera, you can go to the, uh, go to your instruction manual or go to the website for your camera manufacturer and they'll tell you the bit rate of your camera. Okay, and in this particular example, I think I'm talking about a Sony, what am I using here, an uh, FS5, I think. Um, 100 megabits per second uh, bit rate in your camera. Uh, we know that a V30 card or a UHS class three card, a standard SD card will be sufficient because we could get what, 240 megabits per second, right? So if the camera's uh, bit rate is natively 100, then this card, this V30 card is gonna be just fine because it's much faster. You can record much faster than the camera is capable of, of recording at 100 megabits per second, okay? But I switch cameras in the middle of this and I talk about going to a GH5 from a Sony FS5. Well, the GH5 has a different bit rate. It has a 400 megabits per second bit rate in 4K. So this card, a V30 card, V30 times eight, 240 megabits per second is not sufficient if you're gonna put it in a Panasonic GH5 and try to record 4K resolution because the bit rate of the camera jumps to 400. So if you're gonna use this card in a Panasonic GH5, you would have to go to 2K mode or 1080 mode, 24P, in order for the camera's bit rate to slow down to something that can uh, be accommodated by this, by this piece of media, okay? So in this example, I say we've got, we're gonna use a GH5 with a bit rate of 400 megabits per second. We're gonna need a V60 card. How do I know a V60? Well, this is a V30, 30 times eight is 240 megabits per second. A V60 card then, would be 60 times eight, which would be 480 megabits per second, okay? So if I'm gonna use a Panasonic GH5 that records 4K at 400 megabits per second, I need a V60 SD card in order to accommodate 4K resolution at, 20, at 60p, okay? So next, we need to choose our, our card capacity. So we do that by calculating the bit rate of the camera per minute and then dividing that number into the capacity of the card. So we can calculate the capacity of an existing card based on its total file capacity. And then I give you a for instance. If we have a 64 gigabyte card, V30, and we wanna shoot at 100 megabits per second with our FS5, how much recording time do we have? And I went back to the FS5 for the sake of this number, which is easier to sort of calculate in your head on the fly. Okay, start by multiplying the total capacity, 64 gigabytes by 1024. Why am I doing that? If we look at the bits versus bytes comparison, we see a bit is the basic component of data. It's a one or a zero, right? It's the most fundamental uh, piece of data in an image file, right? But bits is really granular. It's a lot of digits to start talking about an image file when we're talking about billions and billions of, of bits. So we start breaking it off into bigger bytes. So literally byte is eight binary digits, okay? So eight bits equals a byte. Well, if we wanna convert from bytes to kilobytes, we have to multiply by 1,024 bytes, okay? And each time we go up in category, byte to kilobyte, kilobyte to megabyte, megabyte to gigabyte, we're multiplying by 1024, okay? So that's where we get that number 1024 from. So we take 64 gigabytes and we multiply it by 1024 to get to a megabyte factor. Then we multiply that value by eight to get to a megabyte bits factor, okay? That's what this whole top row of the formula is all about. Card capacity times 1024 times eight. So it's uh, gigabytes to megabytes, megabytes to megabits, okay? That's the top line of the formula. The bottom line is the camera's recording rate 
times 60 and 60 is merely 60 seconds in a minute. So we wanna know how many minutes of recording time we're gonna get on a card. So we multiply the bit rate times 60 and that'll give us a minute factor on the bottom of our formula. Okay, and when we run all those numbers through the formula, okay, we see that we get uh, 87.38 minutes of recording time or basically one hour and 27 minutes of recording time in a Sony FS5 at 100 megabits per second on a 64 gigabyte data card, okay? That's how that formula is supposed to work. So now you could take this formula and then you could apply it to the GH5 problem uh, and you could figure out how much recording time you'd get on a 128 gigabyte card. If we do that, we'd say, okay, uh, the capacity in minutes is going to be equal to 128. Let's do it real quick. 128 times 1024 will give us a megabytes number, which is kind of big, 131,072. Then we're going to multiply that times eight to get to megabits. And we're going to get this big number right here, a million 48,576. But then we're going to divide that by the bit rate times 60, okay? So I should have done that probably first. Let's go the bit rate of 400, Panasonic GH5, 400 megabits per second times 60 is 24,000, okay? 24,000, so let's remember 24,000 and we'll do that other math again. 128 times 1024 equals times eight and this divided by 24,000 is going to give us a total recording time on that card of 43.7 minutes on a card like this, if it was a V60 card. Okay, 128 gigs will give us basically that much, 43.7 minutes, okay, in 4K. That's how this formula works, okay? Now, you'll use this once or twice. You won't have to use this all the time. Uh, I use this formula initially when I buy cards for a camera or when I'm buying data cards and I wanna know, for instance, I'm predominantly shooting 4K resolution or right now, I think, I think every camera that I have right now shoots some version of 4K. So my worst case scenario is going to be like my pocket cinema camera, um, 4K resolution at, I think it peaks out at 75 frames now, um, which is a lot of data, right? So if I'm going to put a, a card in there, I know I'm probably, I'm going to be using a CFast card. I know that already because I'm above 24 frames per second in 4K. But if I want to know exactly what size card I want in order to get 10 minutes worth of recording time, I think I figured it out and I can end up, I can use a 32 gigabyte CFast card in my pocket 4K camera, 32 gigabytes. And that gives me 10 minutes of recording time. And why do I do that? Do you guys remember? See, when I was your age, we shot movies on film. So remember a film magazine a thousand foot roll of film lasted roughly 10 minutes of recording time, right? So my whole professional life, cameras reloaded every 10 minutes, right? Because we were shooting film thousand footers, right? And so I'm kind of used to that. So now, even now in the digital age, I like an SD, an SD card or a CFast card that'll give me about 10, maybe 20 minutes of record time. And then I want to change cards, right? Because that was the workflow that I learned from very early on as a very young adult, right? Camera reloads every 10, every 10 minutes or so. And if I know the camera re reloads every 10 minutes or so, the assistant directors know that, the director knows that, the actors know that, everybody working on set expects the camera to have to reload after about 10 minutes of shooting, right? So we kind of build that expectation into our daily routine, right? 
And, and I know, for instance, as a lighting technician, when I grew up and out of the camera department and I started gaffing movies, I still remembered, hey, the camera has to reload every 10 minutes. So I, you know, I know that after we do a couple of really long takes of this scene, the camera's gonna have to reload and I'm gonna have an opportunity of two or three minutes while the first AC reloads the camera where I can tweak my lights or I can ask for another light to be brought in and I can add something to the shot. I can make adjustments and I have a little bit of time in there, a buffer while the camera's reloading where I can do some work, right? And the assistant directors know that as well. And so what we used to use, the camera reload announcement on set, when, when I used to announce that as a camera AC, camera has to reload, right? All the department heads knew at that point, they had two or three minutes where they could take a break, go have a smoke, go to the bathroom, fix a light, make an adjustment, do whatever they had to do while I had my fingers in the camera and I was taking the old mag out and threading the new mag in, in place, okay? And so it was kind of the cadence that we were used to. And so I like that even in the digital era. I don't wanna have a digital card in the camera that I could shoot four hours straight on and not have to stop, right? Because now I've lost that, I've lost that cadence. I've lost that sort of built-in break that I used to have every time the film cameras reloaded, right? To do stuff. So I don't wanna have, I don't wanna ruin that part of the workflow in my day by having a media card that's, you know, I can press record in the morning and turn it off in the afternoon and the whole day's work is on one card. To me, that makes me very, very nervous. I know that with one push of a button, I could ruin the day's work. And I would never want that to happen. It's a terrible, terrible feeling if it ever happens to you. So I like small data cards for that reason. And I need to know this so I can figure out exactly what kinds of cards I want to shoot based on the camera that I'm using and the codec, the resolution, and the frame rate. Okay, all that goes into consideration. That was really the conversation that was most important about this day. Okay, it was really about you know, what kind of media are you using? What are the limitations of the media? For instance, uh, a lot of SD cards, you can't do high speed, okay? You have to go to CFast. CFast has higher bit rate recording speeds. And certain cameras have certain media recording requirements. Uh, some cameras only use CFast or they only use SD or they might use a combination of the two. Right, and you have to know the bit rate that the camera is recording at, and then you have to know the capacity of the card, and then you can really have a conversation about how long you can record stuff, uh, and decide yourself. Do you like, you know, are, if you're a documentary uh, filmmaker, for instance, and you've got a really sensitive client that's going to come in and give you two hours of questioning, they're going to want to do it all in one chunk, and then they're going to want to leave, right? Um, you probably don't want to be reloading the camera frequently on a shoot like that because uh, the talent might get nervous or decide that they want to leave or they want to end the interview early. Um, and then you're at a disadvantage. So if you're a documentary person, you might want a longer data card. Um, but if you're shooting narrative, I think shorter cards make a lot more sense. And this is going to help you figure out what, what card's going to be best for you. Okay. That was the takeaway from uh, week four. And I think it's kind of the, you know, the lead off conversation, really. I mean, we're going to figure out what role we're going to serve in the camera department. We're going to pick a camera that we want to work with. Then we're going to pick the recording media that we're going to use um, and figure out what it needs to be, what size it needs to be, what format it needs to be, and so forth. Um, and that really kind of gets our whole ball rolling, right? So I did ask you in week five uh, to survey some different cameras, uh, cameras that are available to you at school or whatever, and to tell me in your own words in a discussion post, which camera you think you would uh, wanna use or what camera would work best for the kind of filmmaking that you're doing. And that was the essence of the um, assignment in week five, pretty simple week. Um, Moving into week six, though, we started talking about lenses and what do lenses do? What lenses 
do you want to use? What lenses are good for what types of shooting applications? And it starts to get a little bit more complicated. So we figured out what role we serve in the department, what camera we're going to use, what media we're going to record with, and what codecs we're going to use, and what bit rates. Now we got to look at our lenses and we got to figure out what lenses do we need? What lenses do we want to use? What, what is it that the lens is doing? And why are there so many different kinds? Okay, so we had a conversation about that uh, in week six. So let me open up my keynote here in week six. Come on, there we go. And we see that cinema lenses are going to start having a lot of different sort of details and things that we need to be concerned with. Um, and then we, we asked the question, well, cinema lenses, what does that mean versus any kind of lenses, for instance, what's the difference? And we've got lenses for photographic cameras, we've got lenses for cinema cameras, and each one kind of is was created with a different kind of workflow in mind. So for instance, over in the RTV department uh, at Nicholson, um, they have a lot of Canon 5D cameras for their ENG people, their news gathering people and they have Canon photographic lenses that they're using on those cameras. And then in the film department, we have Ursa Minis and we have Ursa Pocket uh, 6Ks and we've got also Canon uh, DSLRs, but we also have Canon glass or we have cinema glass. Like for instance, we have the Rokinon series of cinema lenses uh, in, the, in the film department. Well, what's the difference? And the difference came down to mostly ergonomics between the two different types of lenses. So photographic lenses are designed to be used by single operators, no camera assistant, no team of people working around the camera, one individual who is going out and executing photographs or shooting video as a single operator doing their own focusing, doing their own framing and composition. Uh, and a photographic lens works best in that kind of workflow where you're holding the camera to your eye. Like we see this individual here, he's holding the viewfinder to his eyes, focusing manually by hand here. And the lens is set up uh, to accommodate that kind, of, that kind of operation, okay? But a cinema camera has more people clamoring around it, right? So we have a first AC that's trying to focus the lens, but they're not looking through the viewfinder. The operator's looking through the viewfinder. And the second AC is slating and, and helping with the tripod and getting the accessories. And, and we've got three or four people moving around the cinema camera at all times. And the lenses are then designed to integrate into features like follow focus apparatus and things that the first AC is using to focus the lens manually uh, while the operator is composing the shot through the viewfinder. So a cinema lens has to be sort of constructed with a different set of criteria than a photographic lens. And the biggest difference, I think I have an illustration down here, uh, is gonna be in the ergonomics of the lens. So for instance, this is a Rokinon 35 millimeter lens for a photographic application. And you'll notice that it's got a rubber grip surface here on the focus ring. So it can be focused manually by hand um, it has iris uh, adjustment control back here near the lens mount. And if we look at the cinema version of the same lens, this is also a 35 millimeter Rokinon lens, but this is the cinevised version. And by that, we mean the focus ring, the rubber grip surface on the focus ring has been replaced by an integrated pitch gear, it's called. And this is a set of teeth that run along the circumference of the barrel of the, of the lens so that we can apply something like a follow focus unit to the outside of the lens. And the first AC can execute a follow focus uh, maneuver with the cinema lens on a cinema camera without having to uh, look through the viewfinder and focus uh, manually by hand, okay? So the, that's the fundamental difference between a cinema lens and a photographic lens is going to be that ergonomic difference, okay? But it's not the only difference between a cinema lens and a photographic lens, but it's the most immediate, most obvious difference if you looked at the two lenses side by side, okay? Another difference between a photographic lens and a cinema lens might be the actual, the physical size of the, of the, 
of the lens itself. Photographic lenses tend to be physically smaller, smaller in diameter and smaller in overall size and shape uh, because they're meant to be handled by hand and most people's hands aren't real big. So they don't need a massive uh, lens like a, like a zine, for instance, these uh, zine series, professional cinema lenses from Rokinon, these have 114 millimeter barrel diameters. Okay. And that's bigger than physically bigger than the, the palm of most people's hand. Right. And so there's a reason why this lens needs to be as big as it is. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But basically, ergonomics are playing a major role in the difference between cinema lenses and photographic lenses. OK. Uh, cinema lenses also tend to be built to higher tolerances in manufacturing. So cinema lenses, uh, in many cases, will be a lot sharper than photographic lenses. A lot of photographic lenses that are out there that people are using on their pocket cameras and their uh, their DSLRs and 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 so forth are adapted using special adapters you can buy at like Amazon.com for instance, and you can go on a website like um, KEH Camera Brokers out of Atlanta and you can buy a a Nikon 50 millimeter lens that was made in 1980 let's say. Um, and you can pick it up for maybe $40, right? Uh, and you can get a little adapter off of eBay or Amazon, and you can put that Nikkor 50 millimeter lens on your Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. And it will look great in terms of the image that it can produce with that camera. The problem will be the Nikkor 50 will be a really small uh, lens that you'll have to adapt in certain ways to, to make it agreeable with the camera assistant slash cinematic workflow of a motion picture camera. Okay. And one of the things that you might want to do to that Nikkor 50 millimeter lens in order to make your first AC's job easier would be to apply uh, a focus gear to the barrel of that Nikon 50 millimeter lens so that you can use your focus assist, okay? So the focus assist has a wheel uh, for the AC to grasp and to turn to execute focus, but it has this little integrated drive gear right here, which when mounted to the rods of say your Blackmagic camera, uh, will integrate into either the built-in pitch gear of your cinema lens or it will integrate into the plastic or rubber pitch gear that you'd add to your photographic lens so that you could use this follow focus apparatus effectively uh, as a first AC, okay? Then your little $40 Nikkor lens you bought from KEH uh, online uh, becomes a really great investment because to buy the Rokinon 50 millimeter lens might cost you 600 bucks. So, uh, there can be a distinct advantage in using, for instance, vintage photographic lenses on your cinema cameras in that you can get them for cheap, right? But then you've got to put up with the, you know, little idiosyncrasies of adding gears, you know, to accommodate your follow focus and the physical size of the lens, you know, being smaller uh, than a Rokinon 50. Rokinon 50 is quite a bit larger lens, okay? And so... If you can <clears throat> justify the compromises you have to make to save money on the photographic lens, you might enjoy other aspects of that photographic lens. For instance, a Nikkor lens made in 1980 is going to have a very distinctive color rendition, a very distinctive contrast rendition. Um, the lens is going to have what we call a look, right? And that look it will be very sort of unique in its own way. And so what you can start doing when you pick lenses for these cameras is once you've decided whether or not you're going to use cinema lenses or photographic lenses, now you're looking at lenses from a different point of view. Now you're looking at the lens from the aesthetic value that it represents. And for instance, that Nikkor 50 millimeter from 1980 is going to have a very unique look to it. And that might be a look that you really like. Or maybe you're shooting, uh, maybe you're making a film uh, or you're shooting a project that 
is a period piece or it has a vintage quality about it. And so you don't want to shoot on a very clean and clinical looking digital cinema lens made in 2021, for instance, um, because it's too clean and too sharp and too clinical. Um, and if you want to give a film more of a period look or a vintage look, you might shoot it with a vintage lens set. So you might seek out lenses uh, from a particular time period and manufacture because of the qualities, aesthetic qualities that those lenses represent. For instance, um, in 1972, when Gordon Willis shot The Godfather, he shot that movie on a, on a very conventional set of Bausch & Lomb cinema lenses uh, called Cine Baltars. And, and they were run of the mill in 1972. You know, a lot of films were being shot with those lenses and they were very common and they were considered at that time state of the art. Well, lens manufacturing has come a long way since 1972. And so a set of, for instance, uh, Airy Master Primes or um, uh, Cook Ultra Primes made in 2020, for instance, are going to have superior performance in terms of sharpness, contrast, color saturation, and everything to those Cine Baltars made in 1972. But maybe you're shooting a movie where you don't want the super sharp, high performative value of a set of Zeiss Master Primes, for instance, and you want the film to have more of a vintage feel, you might seek out a set of Bausch & Lomb Cine Baltars. You might go to Claremont Camera in Hollywood or the basement in Panavision in Tarzana or camera services in New York and ask them if they have an old set of Cine Baltars that you can shoot your movie on because you want the images to have that kind of baked in look that the lenses can provide. And I know that we can do a lot with post-production processes now. We can do a lot with software and and by all means, DaVinci Resolve is an amazing, amazing color corrective application and linear editing uh, application. But there's a certain value in having a baked in look that you would get from a vintage lens that would be very hard for you to kind of recreate after the fact using pull down menus and plugins for DaVinci Resolve instead of just using a vintage lens and getting all of that value uh, sort of baked into your image files by using an actual vintage lens. So um, these are choices that you'll make down the road when you start shooting things uh, for clients and clients might have specific um, aesthetic requirements that they are asking for or something that they you know a look that they really love or admire and they want their product to have those same attributes and so um, you could think of vintage lenses as like um, you know the spices you might use in cooking right the types of ingredients you might use uh, when you're making a uh, you know a meal you know you can use salt and pepper you can use oil and vinegar you can use you know uh, italian spices you can use fresh herbs from your garden or whatever and and each one of those ingredients is going to offer a different sort of uh floral or or taste value to the dish that you're creating right and and lenses can have kind of the same value to your images if you can think about it that way if you can make that kind of association um, it's the lenses are the spice uh, of the visual uh, palette right so uh, vintage lenses there's a lot to, to be said for using them um, you just might want to be aware of some of the drawbacks that uh, vintage lenses have like their size the fact that they lack focus gears um, they might have um, they might not have uh, bright minimum f-stops like the new cinema lenses have where they can open up their aperture to very, very large f-stops and allow a lot of light to come in through the lens very quickly. 
uh, which is handy for low light shooting situations. Some of the older vintage lenses don't open as brightly as the new cinema lenses do. So that, that can be a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, it really is a personal choice at some point. I know that in my own personal collection, I have vintage lens sets uh, and I have conventional modern cinema glass uh, in my camera package as well. And it really just depends on what I'm shooting. Um, you, you don't necessarily use the same lenses for everything that you shoot. Some jobs you might want a vintage look, some jobs you want a contemporary look, some jobs doesn't really matter one way or the other. So you pick the contemporary cinema lenses for their ease uh, of integration more than anything else. It really all starts uh, becoming personal choices at some point. Um, and I think that was really the basic takeaway uh, from this conversation on this particular day um, was, you know, what kind of lenses do you want to use? Uh, what sacrifices are they going to have? Um, and then we're going to talk about how you're going to use those lenses as a first AC, uh, executing things like your focus pulls and so forth um, that you're going to be doing sort of on a, on a shot by shot, day by day basis. Uh, working on a film set. So um, choice of lenses, very important. The takeaways, major differences between cinema lenses and photographic lenses uh, as demonstrated by our conversation. So that was really week six. Week seven was kind of part two of the lens question and it's filters. And so just like you pick a lens for its uh, image rendering characteristics, you might also need a filter from time to time that's going to have its own specific set of uh, advantages and functions uh, that when used in conjunction with your lens choice is going to give you uh, sort of the, the polish uh, or the finishing touches on your, on your images. And I'm talking about a few specific types of filters at this point. There are literally hundreds of different kinds of filters that you can use on a cinema camera. Um, and the longer you do this and the more filters that you get exposed to or uh, learn how to use from other cinematographers, um, it'll add to your own repertoire. But there are a few basic filters you need to, you need to know about and understand uh, early on because they're gonna help you with your basic cinema, cinematography requirements. And those are gonna be your color correction filters, your polarizers, your diffusion filters, and then maybe something like close-up uh, diopters um, and optical flats, which are nothing but clear filters, protective filters. And each of those, I'm gonna to describe to you basically what they're doing, okay? Filters, uh, just like the vintage lenses that you might choose to shoot with, your filters can also give you a baked in look. In other words, if you're gonna use a color filter for something, um, that color is gonna get baked into your video file, right? And it's gonna be very difficult for you to change your mind later if you add color filtration to your shots uh, and then you want to have all your shots end up being neutral uh, in color later. For instance, I was looking at um, some stuff on HBO the other night. Uh, there's a show that a lot of my students like to watch called Euphoria. I don't know if you've seen it, um, but there's a lot of use of color in the lighting and in the filtration in that TV show. Um, and that is a conscious decision that those directors and that cinematographer uh, have made. Um, in the moment that those images are created. In other words, they don't defer the use of color to post-production. They say, you know, in this scene, I think it's appropriate that the, the, the characters are seen with these kinds of colors going on, whether it's the lighting or filters on the lens to sort of elicit emotion from the audience, a mood or a feeling that, that the filmmakers want the audience to be experiencing while they're watching a particular episode. And so when you put a filter on the lens, it kind of bakes that decision into your image file, okay? And it's really hard to go back and reverse yourself later. It's also, um, I don't think it's as um, effective to add color filtration in post-production as it is to do it in camera. I think uh, there's certain aspects of filtration that when done in post-production just don't have the same uh, degree of aesthetic quality, I think. 
uh, as when you make that choice and you commit to it uh, in the moment that you shoot a piece of footage, right? So uh, filters, just like lenses, filters can be a very kind of creative and conscious choice that you make um, either before you shoot something or in the midst of shooting something, but very rarely do you make these choices after the fact. And some filters you really can't uh, add after the fact. For instance, the polarizing filters, one of the first filters we talk about. Um, it's one of the five filters that Ira Tiffin uh, describes as the critical filters in any camera package. And the polarizer, what it's doing is basically uh, helping to accentuate uh, or saturate colors uh, in your images. For instance, here's a split screen of, a, of an image of a lighthouse shot without a polarizer and with a polarizer. And the first thing that you notice between the two frames is the sky is much deeper blue uh, under the polarizer than it is without the polarizer. Red is less saturated, blue is less saturated, green is less saturated, right? The polarizer is going to deepen and brighten all of your colors. Uh, so for day exteriors, uh, polarizer can be um, a very uh, it can it, it can add a, a very uh, an impact to your images, uh, a little something extra, a little pop uh, in all of the colors or in the contrast of your images that can be very exciting for the audience. And while this can be done effectively in post, you can saturate or desaturate colors with DaVinci Resolve relatively easily. There's something else a polarizer does that you can't fix in post, and that is uh, a polarizer can also reduce surface reflections on things like water, glass, and so forth. So if you're shooting a shot, here's another split screen of a day exterior uh, and a little stream. And with the polarizer filter in place, uh, you can see right into the water and you can see all the, you know, the river rock and the little fish and things swimming around in the water. But without the polarizer, the sun and the sky are reflecting off the surface of water and you can't see any information or any detail below the surface because you've got all this glare happening. So a polarizer, when used in camera in the moment of image creation, can offer you something like uh, glare or reflection reduction um, and you can't do this in post later. You can't remove reflections from water and glass after the fact in post. You just can't do it. Um, I had another example here. Uh, where did I put it? Um, who I might not have it in this presentation. Uh, I shot a little video. Uh, I did it uh, uh, looking through the windshield of my car and with the polarizer in place, you can see through the windshield of the car, you can see the driver behind the steering wheel. So if you had a camera mounted to the hood of your car, for instance, and you're doing a driving shot running down the road, if you want to see the driver and the passenger talking, having a conversation inside the car, you're probably going to want to use the polarizer to remove the sky glare from the surface of the windshield. Right. And without the filter, of course, you get all the, the glare on the windshield and you can't see who's driving the car uh, and you can't really follow the scene or the conversation very well. So the polarizer is a really handy filter in that regard. Basic color correction, uh, the filters that we use for, you know, simply correcting, uh, for instance, daylight balanced film stock to shoot indoors under artificial lighting or vice versa. Uh, a lot of that can be done now with basic camera CCT adjustments like the, um, the Ursa Minis, for instance. Um, if you're shooting indoors under artificial lighting, um, you can just tell the camera to color balance or to white balance for 3200 Kelvin, which is the color of artificial lighting. Um, and the camera will produce neutral tones and basically white light um by simply flipping a switch on the camera so on a film camera we used to have to use color correction filters if we had a film stock for instance that was balanced for shooting in the studio with artificial lighting if we wanted to go outside and shoot a scene day exterior with the same film stock we would have to add an orange filter to the camera lens uh, otherwise our images would come out looking very very blue because the film that was balanced for indoor lighting on stage was different color balance than the sunlight that happens naturally outside on a day exterior. So we'd have to apply color filtration 
to correct the images, but that's something that the digital uh, era has sort of made a lot easier for us by virtue of uh, you know basic camera features being adjustable by the flip of a switch. So color corrective filters don't play as big of a role anymore as they used to, unless you want to color your images specifically. Uh, if you want everything to have a cool blue tone to it, no matter what you're shooting, you might add a what we call a cooling filter or a cool blue filter to your lens. And then you don't have to do that kind of color correction in post. The only, the only caveat is once you choose that filter, you've chosen that filter's density as well. So if you, if you look at your images later in post and you decide that they're too blue or they're not blue enough, you're going to have to go back in and color correct all over again to adjust what the filter did in camera. And so in DaVinci Resolve, if you want to just put a basic blue tone on your images, you might choose to do that in, in post-production. And then, of course, you have the flexibility of all the variations in blue hue that you might want to use as a result. Um, other filters that are important for you to want to use, uh, neutral density filters. So I talked about ND filters quite a lot, uh, more so in the uh, exposure control uh, portion of the semester. Uh, when we're talking about balancing exposure. Neutral density filters, you remember what I called neutral density filters? Sunglasses for the lens, remember? Um, if you go outside and you're shooting with a camera that has a very high ISO sensitivity and you've got a lot of available light, you might want to use neutral density filters to help with the exposure control uh, in terms of camera exposure. Um, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes, but uh, neutral density filters, very important for controlling exposure. And they're just really uh, gray filters that just add, uh, they lighten or really help darken an image if you have an overabundance of available light. Like if you're shooting outdoors at the beach, for instance, um, you know, you can close the iris and uh, your lens down significantly to control the amount of light coming through and hitting your image sensor, but sometimes the iris control is not enough. If you've got, you know, noonday sunlight at the beach in cocoa, for instance, um, simply using iris control is not gonna be enough uh, for you to balance exposure. And you might wanna have a set of neutral density filters with you at that time as well. Uh, so that these in conjunction with iris control give you all of the exposure control you're going to need. Filters are held in something called a matte box if you're using cut glass. Some filters will just screw on the front of a lens like these color corrective filters or these close-up filters I, I'm showing you now. These will just screw on the front of your Rokinons, for instance. But if you're using a set of large lenses like those zines I showed you with 114 millimeter barrel diameters, then you're not gonna have filters that are roughly six inches wide. You're gonna have cut glass square filters like these and they're going to fix into a matte box, which then mounts to the front of your camera by virtue of the iris rods, okay, iris rods. Um, what else did I talk to you about? Diffusion in terms of filtration. Uh, diffusion is another uh, effect that you can't really do well in post-production. Uh, it's something that you should really do in camera at the time. Diffusion is a softening of the fine detail. A lot of cinematographers kind of feel like even 4K resolution is just too sharp. It's too clinical looking. And the images, they feel the images don't look natural. Uh, they're too sharp. <clears throat> and so uh, using a diffusion filter uh, of varying densities can help you just sort of soften up the fine detail in an image and give it a little bit kinder, less toothy, less clinical look. And I gave you this video to check out in web courses on your video page. It's the Tiffin 4K diffusion test. And it shows you a variety of different Tiffin diffusion filters uh, with images with and without the, the filtration. So you can sort of see what different diffusion filters will do. Uh, this is also a very personal choice. Some people like heavy diffusion on filtration. Some people don't like diffusion at all. Um, I think it's really, uh, as a cinematographer, it becomes sort of a personal choice. Or 
If you're a director with a personal choice about the use of diffusion, it could be for aesthetic reasons, it could be for storytelling reasons. Um, <clears throat> you're going to want to be familiar with what different diffusion filters will do. This is a great comparison video for that uh, to achieve that uh, understanding. Here's a quick illustration of what ND filters are doing for you. Drop them in and you can reduce the overall brightness or exposure of your images accordingly. Um, and again, day exterior is typically when you're going to want to apply that type of filter. Um, there's a uh, B&H Kelby training video on uh, neutral density filters that I have for you in web courses. You can check that out. Uh, in your exposure worksheet from week nine, um, I gave you this chart again, and it talks to you about uh, ND filtration um, and what kind of exposure uh, adjustments you have to make to accommodate uh, specific kinds of ND filters. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, just understand that there is a cost associated with using your ND filters, and that generally is uh, a, a recalculation of exposure in some form or fashion, um, either to accommodate a specific aperture that you want to use uh, or simply to manage an overabundance of available light. Okay. Um, that's the gist of the filter conversation. Then we had a midterm quiz. And when we came back from the midterm, we started talking to you about exposure control. And that was week nine. So let me go back to week nine here and take a look at exposure control. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions up to this point? Um, we're more or less halfway through the semester at this point in terms of the stuff we've covered. Um, did anybody have any concerns or specific questions about anything so far? Are we good? Yep. All righty then, shall we move on? <laughs> exposure and the exposure worksheet. Wow, most people really hate the exposure worksheet. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> it's an aspect of cinematography that I think takes, it takes a little bit of time, I think, to wrap your head around it completely and to have it become functional secondhand knowledge. Um, so it's always a little bit of a of, a, of a, a daunting task to cover exposure control in cinematography one because we have people with different levels of experience already, e even in uh, sophomore year in film school. Um, and so some folks I think take to the topic a little quicker than others, uh, not to worry. Um, you know, all things in time, right? And so the more you practice with something, the better you're going to get at at understanding it and using it, making it a functional part of your, your daily workflow. Um, but exposure can be a little bit tricky, and it's based on three things. And I use the graphic of the exposure triangle to sort of illustrate that point. It is um, three aspects of exposure control that we can uh, change to varying degrees and get different different results. Uh, and there's uh, the three uh, variables that we talk about are your camera shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO, or your uh, sensitivity of your capture device, ISO, okay? Uh, and that's what's known as the exposure triangle, okay? So I gave you guys a PDF that you can download off of web courses called Ex Understanding the Exposure Triangle. And it talks about all the different aspects that I'm going to describe to you here. So the exposure triangle has a series of variables that when you adjust them one way or the other will have discrete uh, effect on the overall exposure of your image or the presentation of your image. Is it too bright? Is it too dark? And so forth. Uh, the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. The aperture is the... Uh, control that resides in your camera lens, and that's the diaphragm in the lens that you can turn to open or close, make that diaphragm bigger or smaller, and that allows light to pass through the lens, and that light hits your image sensor and creates your image file by virtue of your image processor. Okay, there's a shutter speed associated with your frame rate of your camera, so 
at 24 frames per second. Uh, you have a particular uh, shutter speed associated with your camera and you can change that speed faster or slower to, uh, to create different effects uh, in your images as long as you balance that adjustment with some subsequent adjustments to one of the other two uh, variables in your exposure triangle. And understand that each of these three control variables when you adjust one, you probably have to adjust one or two of the others as well in order to maintain a balance between the three factors, okay? So aperture is control of the diaphragm in your lens, the size of the diaphragm opening, allowing light to pass through the lens. Shutter speed is typically associated with your frame rate. And then ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor. Am I shooting inside under low light, inside under bright light, outside under bright light, outside under dim light, right? and then you set your camera's ISO accordingly, okay? So if we look at each of these variables independently, we can talk about the virtues of each. So the aperture, here's the diaphragm inside your lens, okay? As you turn your aperture ring on your manual uh, cinema lens, uh, you change the size of this opening, right? The smaller the opening, the sharper the images will appear, more information will be in focus between the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. That's called depth of field. And the wider the aperture, uh, the more light can pass through the lens at a given moment, but you'll have less in focus between the foreground and the background, shallower depth of field, we call that. And that can give the image a, a, a softer appearance as well. And uh, I gave you a video to look at called What is Aperture? Basically, apertures uh, can be controlled by manually turning the aperture ring on your cinema lens. And this is showing you a standard scale of different f-stops or apertures that you can select on your lens uh, in photography, for instance. Your wider uh, aperture openings are associated with your lower f-numbers and your smaller aperture openings are associated with higher F numbers. And it seems counterintuitive, right? Small lens opening, large number. If you think of this as a fraction, instead of a whole number, it starts to make sense. The size of this aperture opening is about 1 16th of what this aperture opening is, right? So in that regard, if you think of these as fractions, then it starts making more a bit more sense, right? Depth of field, is how much is in focus between the foreground, middle ground, and background of your image, right? And at wider apertures like f2 or f2.8, for instance, you can have an extreme difference between out of focus objects in the foreground, objects in sharp focus at the plane of focus, and then backgrounds that fall slowly and gently out of focus as well based on uh, wider open apertures. The smaller the aperture gets, the less this difference becomes. And you might start drawing your background into sharper focus with a smaller aperture or bringing something in the foreground into sharper focus with a smaller aperture. A focus puller, the first AC, is generally used to using wider apertures like 2 and 2.8 so that the director and the cinematographer can create this three-dimensional feel, middle ground, foreground, and background. And then if we want to see what time it is, the focus puller will throw focus from the object in the middle ground to the foreground so we can read the clock and then throw it back again for dramatic effect. And that's part of that cinematic look that images have. If you look at images created with your cell phone, for instance, on that very small image sensor, small image sensors tend to have a lot more uh, in focus all the time because uh, of the size of the sensor and the lens and the apertures used in your cell phone. So you don't see it in a lot of cases, uh, photographs taken with your cell phone where you can put an object in the foreground and have it be demonstratively out of focus as opposed to something in the middle ground of your image. Everything's gonna tend to be in focus with images out of your cell phone. And that's not associated with a cinematic look. It's associated more with a, uh, with a video look or a, you know, a, um, a computer content look and not necessarily a cinematic look. So choice and strategic choice of aperture sizes has a lot uh, to do with the aesthetic value that uh, soft, 
depth of field can bring to a dramatic image. <clears throat> and then having the ability to throw focus from one zone to another helps us control what the audience sees and, and thinks about when they're watching our, our, our movies, right? If we don't want the audience to worry about what's in the background, we might want to throw the background out of focus with a very wide aperture and shallow depth of field and only give them the plane of focus to think about. So in this shot, it might be really important for the audience to understand something about these books or the titles of these books, for instance, or what, you know, <coughs> what these books might represent. Gravity's Rainbow is a fairly classic piece of literature. There might be some aspect of the narrative that is important that the audience understand or know something about Gravity's Rainbow. And it's not important to know what's in the background or what time it is, right? So we can use shallow depth of field and wide lens apertures to help us with our narrative. Uh, shutter speed related to frame rate. In a film camera, <coughs> you had film getting dragged through the camera at 24 frames per second and a rotating shutter that was allowing light to strike the film and then conversely reflecting film up into the viewfinder so the operator can see what's going on. And this whole relationship is timed out using uh, pull down shutter claw and shutter speed, rotating shutter speed. And at 24 frames per second, it turns out that this shutter is rotating with a speed of one over 48th of a second. Okay, that's the standard shutter speed for a cinema camera at 24 frames per second, one over 48, okay? And in the exposure worksheet, we saw that we can change that frame rate and it has specific effects on our exposure control. So if we slow down our frame rate, we can create fast motion aesthetic <clears throat> value to our images, but we also have to adjust our exposure accordingly by reducing the amount of light coming through the lens, for instance, to accommodate a slower frame rate and vice versa. Faster frame rates will give us a slow motion effect in our final images, but as a result of shooting higher frame rates, we have to have lenses that can open up to very wide apertures to allow a lot of light to come through the lens at one time to accommodate the faster frame rate uh, that the camera is functioning at to give us that slow motion effect. So in the exposure triangle, you can see how when you adjust a slower shutter speed, you need more exposure correction and a faster shutter speed is less exposure and therefore a different setting on your lens. Okay. Um, I talked to you about the ISO, the sensitivity of your lens. Okay. ISO, International Standards Organization, is a group of uh, independent evaluators that just look at image sensors and they decide how much light is required to give a good exposure on an image sensor, an image that's not too bright, not too dark. And they can assign a number value to that ISO, to that sensitivity rating. And it's generally anywhere from 100 to 6,400. Although modern digital cinema cameras can achieve much, much higher ISOs, but they do so <coughs> at the peril of the image quality. We talked about high ISOs having an effect where uh, digital noise uh, or grain can be introduced into the image, the higher you make that ISO number. <clears throat> so lower ISOs ratings for our, our capture devices will give us a tighter detail structure in the image and less signal to noise uh, um, effect or grain effect in the images. But low ISOs require a great deal of light to create exposure. So if you're shooting video at Cocoa Beach during the day in the afternoon, you've got plenty of sunlight from the sun and from the light reflecting off the water and reflecting off the sand. And so a low chip sensitivity of 100 might make a lot of sense when you're shooting day exterior at the beach. But the minute the sun goes down, and the ambient light is dramatically reduced, uh, that 100 ISO is going to be insufficient. It's not going to have enough light gathering sensitivity uh, to produce adequate images. So you'll have to boost the ISO of your camera dramatically 
and therefore require less light uh, to create well-balanced exposure. So when you increase the ISO of your camera sensor, you're basically increasing the sensitivity to light. You need less light at higher ISOs, right? So in terms of the exposure triangle, aperture controls the amount of light flowing through the lens. ISO is controlling how much light you need to create a well-balanced image with your sensor based on what's available, uh, for instance, day exterior, night exterior, for instance, okay? And just understand that there's a trade-off in terms of the signal to noise performance of your sensor. There will be an inherent electronic grain that's introduced the higher the ISO gets on your camera, okay? And I talked to you about a quick cheat, uh, how you can manipulate the exposure triangle so that uh, you only have to adjust one thing at a time, okay? With your camera shutter speed, we know that 1 over 48 is associated with 24 frames per second. And the magic about 24 frames per second is that's the frame rate we need to record dialogue. The lip flap looks best at 24 frames per second when we're recording audio with our visual imagery, okay? So if you're shooting actors and they're saying stuff, you're going to be shooting at 24p and you're going to lock your shutter speed in 1 over 48. And you don't have to worry about that because if you deviate from that adjustment, the audio is not going to match the picture and you're going to have a problem with, you know, it's going to look like your audio is out of sync when you edit your images. So you can lock your shutter speed at 24p. Your ISO can also be locked in. Every camera that you're going to come in contact with is going to have what's called a native ISO. In other words, the manufacturer has determined that the sensor they put in that camera that you're using has an ISO that when you use the native setting, the native ISO designation, the camera will perform best. It will give you the best signal to noise performance. It will give you the best color saturation, the best contrast. Um, and your exposures will look the cleanest at the native ISO. And so all you have to do is go to your camera's instruction manual or go to the camera manufacturer's website and see what the native ISO is for your particular camera and then set that uh, on the camera and forget about it, okay? So like for instance, the Ursa Mini 4.6K that you guys will use in Cinematography 2 <clears throat> has a native ISO of of uh, 400. So when you're using that camera, it, the native ISO is 400. That's kind of low. So immediately off the bat, you're gonna know that with a low ISO, when you're shooting inside, you're gonna need plenty of light. So you're probably gonna be lighting your shots and you're gonna be doing a lot with supplemental lighting. So your little light panels, your little LEDs and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Pocket 6K camera has a native ISO of 800 or 2500 or 3200, I believe. So if you're shooting outside during the day, you might put the camera in 800 ISO mode, which is somewhat lower, and then maybe use one ND filter to help with the uh, available light. Uh, but then you go inside and shoot in a low light situation, you can change the camera's ISO to 3200 and increase the sensitivity of the sensor and have to use less supplementary lighting as a result. So picking the ISO is gonna have a lot to do with whether or not you can light your shots, whether or not you have an abundance of available light and what the native ISO rating of your camera is. Once you know that information and you make that choice, you can lock that value in. So let's say we're shooting with the pocket cinema camera, we're gonna shoot outside, we're gonna lock it in at AS, ISO 800 we're gonna lock in the frame rate at 24p. Now the only part of the exposure that we have to control is our aperture size. And we do that based on how much depth of field we want. So if we want our foregrounds to be really shallow and soft and out of focus, we use wider f-stops. And if we want the background to be sharper in detail so we can see deeper into the background and the foreground, we might use a smaller f-stop. Once we decide what f-stop is appropriate for our imagery, <clears throat> if the image is still too bright, we can add neutral density filters to the lens and control exposure by virtue of adding sunglasses to the lens, okay? And that is how we will control exposure once we lock in these values. 
And that was basically the takeaway from uh, this discussion on this particular day. You guys did the exposure worksheet. I'm sure this nightmare is all too familiar to most of you. <laughs> um, this is a good thing to maybe look back at once in a while and just sort of practice plugging in these values and working with these numbers. There was three pages to the worksheet. Page one was the top, this page right here. Page two was a set of charts that help you uh, understand what the different exposure variables do and what their, um, what their um, values mean. And then on the third page was a set of questions uh, referring to your answers on page one. And I would suggest looking at that from time to time until you get really comfortable with <clears throat> trading and exchanging these values one for the other as you uh, control your exposures on your video shoots. Um, as far as the test and everything, just understand that there's three variables in the exposure triangle and what those basic variables are controlling. Light passing through the lens, sensor sensitivity, and frame rate. And pretty much uh, that's all I'm gonna really hold you responsible for on your final. Um, all of this is extra conversation that you will work with and understand and perfect over time. Um, and that will just come with more practice, okay? Anybody have any specific questions about this section about exposure control? Um, we talked about a lot of things, but um, it's, uh, it's just something that you're going to have to think about uh, frequently uh, in the course of your filmmaking career. Uh, and the more you do it, the more you use those variables and think about how you can mix and match them and trade them one for the other. You'll start to get a gain of familiarity that will become second nature over time. It's just something that takes practice and there's really no other way around it. <clears throat> I kind of talked to you about depth of field concurrently with this exposure conversation. So basically depth of field is just how much of your image is in focus in the foreground, middle ground and background. And that is controlled by the size of the aperture that you select uh, in camera, okay? Section 2.1 was color theory. Um, basically uh, the behavior of light, the color uh, of the light, the uh, contrast of the light. We talk about the visible spectrum. We talk about light and color in terms of frequency uh, and wavelength. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty cut and dry. Um, the thing that I would the the main takeaways you need from this section on color theory is understand that we have two basic presets for camera color temperature correction or CCT, and that is indoor color balance and outdoor color balance. Outdoor balance lighting tends to have bluer frequencies. Sunlight is bluer in color tone than incandescent lighting, which is associated with artificial or indoor lighting. It has an oranger look to it at about 3200 degrees Kelvin, as opposed to 5600 degrees Kelvin. Um, those are the standard daylight and, and uh, incandescent presets on any cinema camera. They are chromatic opposites. In other words, they're opposite each other on the color wheel. And then the other conversation we have, which I think is kind of fun, is what the emotional uh, associations of color can be for your audience. If you use color as uh, part of your narrative, for instance, what do uh, red colors signify emotionally to your audience? What do blue colors signify or yellow? or green. Do you guys remember the emotional associations we had with these different colors? What do we associate emotionally with the color red? Anybody? Romantic. Love, passion. Um, what else? Anger, maybe, right? Uh, what about green? What do we associate emotionally with the color green? Money. Yellow money, green. great. <laughs> so money, concurrently with money, you might associate greed, right? Envy. You ever heard the phrase green with envy? Okay, so the color green might have those types of emotional undertones for your audience sort of nonverbal communication going on between the filmmaker and the audience when you want them to sort of feel a certain way. 
you might select color palettes um, that have, you know, representative of these colors and therefore uh, give the audience uh, a feeling or a general sense about what they're looking at that's communicating on a different level than merely dialogue and performance. Um, what about yellow? What do you think yellow is gonna do for the audience? Innocence. Innocence maybe, happiness. Um, I like to use the example of um, uh, Moonrise Kingdom from Wes Anderson, huge yellow color palette in that movie. And that signified youth, innocence, happiness, um, you know, the gilded memories of childhood. Um, and so the color yellow had a huge significance in that film. Uh, blue might signify calm, peace, nobility. Um, black, what do you think black symbolizes? Death. Death. <laughs> Death, sickness, evil, right? Things of that nature. Uh, white might indicate purity, innocence, um, sterility. Um, so yeah, all of those emotional responses can be uh, elicited from your audience by the effective use of color, either in filtration or in your lighting. And lighting is what we talked about uh, in section 2.2, uh, we start a conversation about lighting anyways. It, usually cinematography two is a is the next phase of the lighting question. Uh, but lighting fundamentals in section 2.2 was all about um, using three-point lighting. And do you remember what the basic... Uh, purpose for three-point lighting, what, 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 what we were trying to achieve by using three-point lighting. Do you remember the objective? <clears throat> three-point lighting gives us a sense of three-dimensionality to our images in a two-dimensional presentation medium like a TV screen or a projection screen. Okay, so in section 2.2, basic lighting, we talk about the components of a three-point lighting scheme. And we start off with um, this guy right here. You remember this guy? This is Rembrandt, right? And Rembrandt is uh, had a fairly notable uh, lighting style to all of his uh, portraiture. Uh, he was a painter uh, in the, uh, uh, what's that, the 17th century, right? And um, specific light placement of his primary source of illumination usually tend to be in the same place, created a highlight that radiated or rolled off gently to a shadow value on the low side and created a little triangle on the shadow side of the face we call the Rembrandt triangle or the golden triangle. Right, so it was a specific directionality to his light source, and he tended to put it uh, in the same place. You know, once he sort of perfected his technique over time, he started tending to put his his what we call a key light or his principal light source, basically in the same spot, and it it always tended to be slightly off angle from what the lens was seeing. Right, so about forty five degrees off axis to what would be our lens and above eye line, okay, slightly above eye level, okay, and that was his um, preferred light source placement, and that became uh, associated with this style or shape or contrast of the light, and we call it Rembrandt lighting or a Rembrandt key light, okay, and I show you demonstrations of this sort of dramatic <clears throat> lighting style that Rembrandt and his uh, contemporary Caravaggio would employ and it was called chiaroscuro. Do you remember the term, uh, the Italian word for the uh, the interplay of highlight and shadow? Okay, chiaroscuro is the word that we describe this kind of lighting, this sort of contrasty, sourcey directional lighting quality that we see in a lot of classic art. Uh, Rembrandt, Caravaggio, um, 
I've got a number of examples to some degree, Leonardo, um, um, but Leonardo was a little bit, he preceded uh, Rembrandt and his, uh, his lighting was a little bit more open, a little bit broader and brighter. Um, I don't know if it had to do with the sign of the times uh, that these guys were living in or what, what sort of social pressures they were experiencing that their lighting all kind of got real dark and moody, but it seems to be coming out of the 1600s. We started seeing this high level of contrast and this, and this directionality, this, we call it sourciness uh, in the lighting scheme. Um, and it was called chiaroscuro by the Italians and associated with classic Baroque art. <clears throat> I show you this guy, Jan Vermeer, and Vermeer had a little bit different, brighter, more open lighting style, more like Leonardo da Vinci did, but Vermeer was coming around the same time as his contemporaries, Rembrandt and Caravaggio. But Vermeer liked to use broad, uh, low contrast window light as his primary light source. He'd still put it slightly above eye line like Rembrandt would do, um, but where Rembrandt was probably using candles uh, or chandeliers to light his subjects, you see how kind of warm they are. Uh, uh, that's an indication of the interior lighting. Candle light is very warm in color. And then it's very contrasty, deep shadows from uh, something like a, a candle uh, flame, uh, a point source of light can be very contrasty as opposed to window light, which can be, as long as the sun's not shining directly through a window, it can be very soft and very low in contrast. And therefore uh, your transitions from highlight to shadow are lower in contrast and softer in transition, um, has a bit, a bit more delicate of a presentation. And so you can get uh, a little bit softer contrast in an image, specifically an image of a young lady, a girl with a pearl earring, for instance. Um, and then you can think about lighting in terms of hardness and softness and directionality, and that can play into the moods that you can elicit from your audience, right? So when we have a tableau like uh, Martha rebuking Mary uh, in this larger, uh, in this larger uh, uh, image from 1660, uh, the central characters here, uh, Martha and Mary, um, there is a literal interpretation that can be made about these two characters based on the quality of the lighting on each of these individuals. And in class, we talked about the fact that Mary is sort of bathed in the direct sunlight and therefore the light of knowledge or the light of information is with Mary and Martha who is, I'm sorry, with Martha's rebuking Mary, this is Mary. So Martha's bathed in the light and she has the light of knowledge and of of in this case, in a, in a higher point of view, the superiority. And uh, Mary has done something very wrong. So her face is in shadow and she's turned away from the light, uh, which indicates that she has somehow, um, you know, she's wrong or she has done something bad. Uh, and so the emotional connotations of the way each of these characters is lit has everything to do with the quality, the hardness and the color quality of the light uh, that's striking each individual. Uh, I talked about the candle flame a little bit uh, a minute ago. I showed you this image and called uh, a, your attention to the different shape and contrast qualities that this artist seemed to be able to sort of figure out uh, in an era where they're creating with paint and uh, canvas, 1630. They still have a keen understanding of how something as sharp as a candle flame would light their subjects and how deep the shadows would be and how quick and hard the transitions would be from highlight to shadow. And I think this is uh, pretty indicative of their skill level um, in this time period to understand without the aid of cameras and recording devices, how light renders on a subject and then visualize that and then paint it on canvas. I think that's pretty extraordinary. And to understand how shadows work and how lighting directionality uh, can work uh, is present in a lot of these uh, early images. And then I showed you some images from classic uh, art talking about in this particular case, the man with armor uh, and how delicate the detail is and how well rendered the highlights are uh, in the surface of this man's armor uh, in the year 1630. 
to have a painter uh, capable of this kind of uh, degree of accuracy, I think is, is, is quite notable. Uh, and then I pointed out to you some contemporary examples of similar, uh, you know, lighting applications, C-3PO in the Star Wars uh, series, for instance, uh, reminds me so much of images like this. And this is, uh, so where we have um, Bylert in 1630, we've got Shishitsky in 1980. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the chiaroscuro, the dramatic, uh, uh, the drama of uh, Barbarian. This is the um, portrait of um, the suicide of Cleopatra. And we're looking at the quality of the light, the hardness of the light, the deep contrast, the idea that characters that are half lit uh, have an emotional sort of association that we can make a character that's half lit. Do you guys remember what half lighting a character symbolizes? Anybody remember? How about conflict or indecision? So a character that's half lit, that has this deep contrast and this sort of split lighting quality, they have two sides of their personality, right? Uh, and this is Cleopatra and she's, um, she is committing suicide, death by adder. She was found guilty of adultery with Mark Anthony, sentenced to death. And so it's like, she's definitely conflicted, right? Um, she committed something that was socially unacceptable in a time where she could be sentenced to death for it. And she might be of two minds about what she's done, right? Maybe she's guilty. Maybe she doesn't regret it at all. You know, she's sort of split in her decision about it. And then we looked at modern applications to dramatic chiaroscuro. The Godfather is a classic example. The, deep eye sockets and this strong jaw contrast and shadow fall off of a top light an overhead top light creates this sort of death mask aesthetic to a character that's associated with the underworld, the organized crime, the, the evil of that men do right. And the Godfather Guido, uh, uh, um, Don Corleone is associated with, um, you know, the seedy underbelly of society. He's a, a crime boss uh, in New York and the, in the uh, 1920s, right? Um, and then we look at um, classics like Rotari's Girl with the Letter. And we deconstructed this in class. I think you'll remember we deconstructed emotionally and symbolically what all of this represents. We talked about the red of passion the fact that she's writing a letter and there's so much red, the red in the wax ceiling and the red in the dress and the red in the lipstick might indicate passion and might indicate that this is a love letter. And who is it to? It's to a forbidden love because the face is in shadow and it's turned away from the light source. So there's a, an emotional or uh, dramatic connotation to that style of lighting. And so you can apply all of these design principles then color theory and lighting uh, control and exposure to your understanding of uh, a, an image like this, and you can derive a lot of meaning without having uh, a narrative cue card to rely on to tell you what this image is all about, right? And then I showed you examples from modern uh, cinematography. This is Blade Runner, right? Uh, and we got, look, we've got a Rembrandt key uh, it's very soft, so so it's not a hard light. It's a soft light, but it's in a Rembrandt position. We've got a bit of a triangular uh, highlight going on on the low side. We have this subtle roll off from highlight to shadow. Uh, very indicative of Rembrandt key lighting. Uh, very soft, very warm in tone, right? Um, and then I showed you Marie Bouillard's self-portrait and compared that to Meg Ryan in When Harry Met Sally, so that you can see sometimes the sources of inspiration inform our modern choices. And maybe we do this constantly, consciously, and maybe we don't. Um, but this is a specific kind of lighting in a time period, 1785, that was sort of associated with maybe a renaissance in, in Europe to some degree. 
um, the light of knowledge, the illumination of knowledge, right? People were becoming more industrious and more um, curious. Uh, and so the lighting is a little bit more open, a little bit lower in contrast. And this individual is um, rendering herself in a way that appears bright and, and vital and curious and open. Um, and so also the character of Megan when Harry met Sally, very innocent, very open, uh, um, and so forth. Um, and so being able to evaluate these different styles of lighting is important, but understanding the components of a basic three-point lighting style, which is a main source light, a fill light that controls contrast, and a backlight, which creates separation between our subject and our background is very important in creating the three-dimensional look or feel of our imagery using lighting exclusively. So the key light, again, is slightly above eye level, 45 degrees off access to the lens. Here's the camera lens. Here's the lens subject relationship. And you'll see the key light is 45 degrees off access to the camera. And you could go in either direction. You don't have to go to the left. You could go to the right as well, and then everything sort of flips. But if our primary source of illumination is our key light, the key light is providing exposure, shape, color, contrast. And then all of that through this one light source, <clears throat> the fill light then becomes strictly contrast control. How deep do you want the shadows to be? The fill light generally occurs directly opposite of the key light so that it can fill in the shadow areas created by the key light. And then to the degree that you use fill light at all will control your contrast. If you start at 50% brightness, in other words, the key light is at 100%, the fill light might start at 50% and go down from there so that your shadows will fill in a little bit, but not completely to where you flatten out the subject's exposure completely. And you guys used the uh, virtual lighting studio to practice that technique and you can see how uh, by changing the intensity of your fill light, you can either flatten out or you can dramatically increase the contrast of your subject and their lighting. The backlight is really just to create separation between the subject and the background itself. Uh, like here on Hugo, uh, he's got an edge light here to separate his shoulder and his hair light from the background. And then we've got one nicely directional Rembrandt key and a very low level of fill over here so that we have a pleasing amount of contrast for a young man, uh, but a little bit of separation against the background so we can pick him out easily uh, from any of the other detail in the frame. And then depth of field throws the background softly out of focus. So we get a nice representation of Hugo in the foreground and the audience understands that this is where we have to focus our attention. He's about to say something very important and we want to be there in that moment to hear this actor uh, and their portrayal, right? Um, we looked at other examples. Here's uh, Joaquin Phoenix from the movie Her uh, talking about how much fill level is used here, a character that's in love. Uh, the colors are warm. The, the source light is soft and low in contrast and the fill is very bright so that the shadows are fairly open. And all of that indicates his lightness of mind, his, his feelings of sort of happiness and being in love. Um, and on the other hand, you might have you know, more contrasty images like from uh, Schindler's List where we have you know, characters in danger and characters that are pursuing and characters that are evading and, and therefore shadows hiding hiding messaging, hiding moods, hiding information, and highlights revealing, uh, you know, the harshness and the texture of, for instance, a Nazi sympathizer and a man who's hiding 50 Jews in his, in his warehouse, right, during World War II, during the pogroms, right? So different lighting style for a different kind of movie, right? And so lighting quality can be very important to our cinematography in that regard. Use of color, use of contrast, shape, um, and then amount of detail that we render in the shadows will all elicit different moods from the audience. Uh, and we just talked about, you know, continual examples. And since we did this relatively recently, I don't think I need to delve too deeply into it. Um, 
most of you did a great job on the homework assignment from this week, the three-point lighting uh, activity on the virtual uh, lighting simulator. I hope you enjoyed that software and I hope that you'll use it uh, you know, frequently in the future, just to practice your lighting and try to figure out the kinds of schemes you might want to use. You can, you know, use frame grabs and create little storyboards, I think, of your of your avatars if you're trying to figure out lighting schemes for your film projects and so forth. Um, so I think this is a good activity and I hope that you enjoyed it. You did a really good job on it. So um, I thank you for that. Uh, and that brought us up to the last week where we were talking about uh, framing and composition. Um, and that was um, fairly quick conversation, not too, uh, not too deep uh, into the concepts because it's more of a cinematography two thing. Um, it was basically talking about um, fundamental design concepts um, like um, uh, pattern, repetition, um, color, contrast, um, bokeh, uh, the extent to which objects in the background are thrown out of focus, um, line, converging lines, repetition, looking for patterns, concentric circles, for instance, lines converging to the horizon, all of these sort of design elements that can be incorporated into our images so that we're doing more than simply just pointing the camera at a situation and pressing record without thinking about what some of this stuff means, what symmetry might mean to an image, for instance, uh, especially when you uh, apply it to, you know, a movie like The Shining, for instance, or I showed you some work by uh, the Westons, uh, uh, father and son, and compared, for instance, uh, the cabbage uh, exposure to uh, footage from uh, The Phantom Thread and talked about uh, lighting uh, can provide texture as well as contrast to a situation and give us a sense of what surfaces feel like, a, a very tangible aesthetic value that the lighting can sort of give us uh, as an audience without being able to reach out and touch the thing. Um, I, I kind of think of a ball gown every time I see this uh, leaf of cabbage by Edward Weston and understand that this movie, the entire aesthetic of this movie is all about revealing the textures of fabrics and this guy is a dressmaker this is uh daniel day lewis playing uh woodcock the dis famous uh, english designer who uh, created all these fantastic dresses for the you know the women of high society and and the passion that he put into it and the work and the design and everything and so the lighting in that movie couldn't be uh, broad and bright and low contrast. It had to be very sort of moody and directional and to some degree hard and, 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 in a, and, and from an angle that would reveal surface texture like we see in Weston's uh, cabbage leaf. Uh, and we can see in the folds of a dress, for instance. Um, talking about what symmetry might mean, what converging lines and, and lines that stretch to the horizon might mean emotionally for the audience. And then talking about how we feel about converging lines and placement of the horizon. This is a bad character where the horizon is low in the frame. Um, Hershey's Kisses, the horizon is high in the frame, has a positive emotional underpinning to it, whereas this has a negative underpinning with the horizon so low and the fact that the lines are converging in a downward direction towards a central figure that has uh, embodied uh, everything that was wrong with Gotham at the moment that this movie was you know, taking place. Um, and thinking about these choices aesthetically when we come, when we compose our frames and, and not just sort of randomly pointing the camera at things and having people play within the field of view. We, we control what the audience sees and we can control how the audience sees it with the lens choice, with the lens angle, with the lighting. Um, and sometimes what the audience doesn't see can be as provocative as what they do see. So sometimes our lighting is meant to reveal uh, with brightness and low contrast. And sometimes our lighting is meant to conceal with shadows and with darkness and with the absence of detail. And so it really depends on what your script is trying to say, what your story is trying to say to your audience 
how you might uh, render that with lighting and, and with lens work. Um, I talked to you about some basic compositional theory about the rule of thirds and how we divide a frame into four uh, important foci uh, where when we put information at these particular places in the frame, the audience instinctively goes there uh, automatically looking for information pertinent to understanding what is happening in the, in the frame overall. Talk to you about um, how we can place elements at these foci to mean certain things to the audience. Talked about the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio applied to compositional elements in classic paintings. And then we talked about it uh, in contemporary uh, film work as well. And we can see how these design elements have been incorporated in a lot of the films that we are looking at. So that was uh, basically our last week uh, together. Um, talking about composition and shot design in that respect. In Cinematography 2, my goal was always to take this conversation a step further and talk to you about coverage, how you dissect a scene into individual shots and then you use your composition and framing fundamentals to inform your decisions on covering a scene. Uh, and, this is, uh, and this is a concept that we take uh, a step further in a, in a class like Cinematography 2. So that's basically, in a nutshell, that's Cinematography 1. Um, I am happy to uh, entertain questions if anybody has anything. Um, I apologize uh, for my absence over the past couple of weeks. Um, I've been recovering from, uh, from some health issues. So it's been a difficult semester for me, but I wanted to at least have this time with you guys to give you one last sort of shot at Q and A or addressing any outstanding questions you might have. Does anybody have anything at this point? Uh, any um, lingering concern over any of this uh, content? I will take that as a no. <laughs> and let's see if I have my, uh, whoops. Um, anybody have any questions and outstanding at this point in time? Any, anything at all that I can uh, address. No. Well, I noticed that I held most of you for the duration of the presentation, which is cool. Um, so please remember that, I mean, the semester is not over yet. Your final is gonna open, um, I think it opens, what, tomorrow? What did I give you guys here? Let's look at the final and see what it says. Uh, it's not due until May 1st at midnight, or I think it's actually technically, yeah, midnight between May 1st and May 2nd. Um, so you've got a little bit of time. Um, what time does it open? Let's see, I think I opened it up. Uh, yeah, it's gonna open, basically it's open now. <laughs> it's just opening now. So you don't have to take it now. You can study a little bit more if you need to. I'm available uh, by email. Uh, we can also do a, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one Zoom if, if that's something that uh, you think might help if you're stuck on something in particular. Um, and you've got a little bit of time. So you got like the better part of a week to, you know, to study the, these concepts a little more before you have to take the quiz. 60 questions, I think, multiple choice. Um, you know, if you take 60 questions and divide it into all the modules that we had this this month, uh, this semester, and all the concepts, it's just enough questions on each topic to see if you have a basic understanding of what was going on. Uh, nothing too uh, granular, uh, nothing too complicated. The, the quizzes, I call it a quiz. I don't like calling it a final test because that freaks everybody out. Um, it's really kind of a quiz, multiple choice. And um, I think if you just do a, a light study beforehand and uh, get well rested the night before and, and, you know, take it and just sit down and do it. Shouldn't take you very long. Um, you have 90 minutes to, to take the, to take the exam. So um, it's a little over three minutes per question. Um, 
you know, and I think you'll be fine. Uh, it's not, it's not a terribly difficult quiz, just enough for us to get a sense of whether or not um, we need to maybe simplify the course uh, a little bit, or maybe we can make it more complex. Uh, um, so give it a shot. But again, I'm available uh, through emails or through one on one zooms between now and uh, this weekend, if anybody needs a little extra time with these concepts, I'll be happy to uh, to spend a little extra time with you. Does anybody have any questions then for me before I wrap this thing up? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Will there be any any questions on the test about the exposure worksheet? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I think once was enough. <laughs> I think, uh, I think we made our point. And as long as you understand the basic concepts that are happening there, uh, I will not ask you to demonstrate that uh, calculation again on the test. That would, I think that would be a little too brutal. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, well. I have a quick question. <laughs> yes, go Sorry. ahead. Sorry, <laughs> um, is there any possibility of like other assignments for extra credit or to help bring up the grade at all? No, there's no extra credit um, in, uh, in the class. Um, however, if you missed any lectures, obviously you can go back and watch the recorded videos and get partial credit back for that. That's usually where folks end okay up, awesome thank you you know folks end up you know taking a little bit of a hit if they don't come to class and so that's why i leave those recorded lectures up there you can get at least half credit back if you give me a little blurb you know watch the video and then give me a little blurb what were the key takeaways it's usually like three key takeaways uh, and give that to me in a little paragraph and submit that as a text submission on the assignment i think i opened them all up uh until the end of the semester so that you can go back and 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 recoup some of that if you need to um, that's really the only provision for extra credit i have and then of course today i'll give whoever came today i'll give you guys uh three points of extra credit towards your attendance grade as well so that should help anybody else i see a thumbs up uh, does that mean we're good? Can we adjourn this meeting then? Because that's our that's our time for today. So, all right then. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, thanks for coming. It's nice to talk to you all at least one last time before the semester is over. So have a good time this summer. Uh, don't forget about your test. If you need anything, shoot me an email. Otherwise, uh, thanks so much, and I appreciate all of your. Uh, your kind uh, well wishes uh, here last week and so forth. And good luck moving forward, everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.